House Government Reform and Oversight Committee continued with its investigation of campaign fundraising, looking into Venezuelan contributions to American presidential elections. Indiana Representative Dan Burton chairs this four-hour hearing. The committee will come to order. Uh, good morning. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight uh, will start its business. Uh, before the distinguished ranking member and I deliver our opening statements, the committee must first dispose of some procedural issues. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14 in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes divided equally between the majority and the minority. And without objection, so ordered. I'd like to start off uh, with my opening remarks today by once again drawing attention to the stone wall we have over on the wall here, which shows some of the problems we've encountered with the investigation. The Speaker of the House has made some comments about this in the last few days. And at the White House yesterday, speaking for the President, Michael McCurry responded to Speaker Gingrich. And here's what he said, and I quote, there's a lot of work to be done, and we'll leave the politics to the speaker. We're going to do the business of the people, end quote. So I just have a couple of questions for the President and Mr. McCurry. Is it the business of the people to have drug dealers and gun runners in the White House in exchange for contributions? Is it the business of the people to rent out the Lincoln bedroom and seats on Air Force One for campaign contributions? Is it the business of the people to stonewall investigations by not turning over documents or delaying documents for long periods of time to the Congress? Is it the business of the people to conceal videotapes of the President at White House fundraisers for six months and longer? And is it the business of the people to abuse, to abuse executive privilege, to block criminal investigations and congressional investigations? These are just a few of the questions I'd like to ask Mr. McCurry. And I think some of those words were two syllables and longer. Today, we continue to look into illegal foreign money that flowed into national campaigns through Florida. In March, we heard testimony about $400,000 in contributions from a German national, Thomas Kramer. We questioned Federal Election Commission officials who investigated this matter. More than $500,000 in fines were assessed. And Mr. Kramer was fined, his lawyers were fined, and his secretary was fined. And the Republican Party of Florida was fined. One important person was not punished in any way. According to the Federal Election Committee General Counsel's report, they obtained evidence that Democratic fundraiser Howard Glicken may have been involved in advising Mr. Kramer to illegally funnel contributions through his secretary. Despite the evidence, the Federal Election Commission decided not to investigate Mr. Glicken. They did not even call him to ask about it. One of the reasons they cited in deciding not to pursue Mr. Glicken was his close personal relationship to Vice President Gore. Today, we will hear testimony about $50,000 in Venezuelan money that was contributed to the Democrat Party during the presidential campaign in 1992. These contributions were made by a prominent Venezuelan banking family headed by Orlando Castro Yanese. Yanese, I hope I pronounced that right. 
The evidence of these illegal contributions emerged during a bank fraud case being prosecuted by New York District Attorney Robert Morgenthau. Mr. Morgenthau won convictions against three members of the Castro family, including Orlando Castro and his grandson, Jorge Castro Burrito. During the course of this investigation, Jorge Castro became a cooperating witness. He revealed the conduit contribution scheme to the prosecutors. The contributions were made during the fall of the 1992 presidential election. They consisted of two $20,000 contributions to the Democrat National Committee and two $5,000 contributions to state Democratic parties. Today, we will, make public bank, we will make public bank records and other documents given to our committee by Mr. Morgenthau's office that show that the $50,000 was reimbursed by the Castro's family business overseas and out of the country. Well, what happened then? Mr. Morgenthau's office referred all of the information on the illegal contributions to the United States Justice Department. They informed the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami. They informed the Public Integrity Section of the Justice Department. They informed the Campaign Finance Task Force. They wrote letters. They made phone calls. The Justice Department interviewed Jorge Castro. They were given all of the documents. The case was practically gift-wrapped for the Justice Department. But for some reason, they simply decided not to pursue it. A year later, they wrote back to Mr. Morgenthau's office and told him that they had no plans to prosecute the case. Now, here's what bothers me. In the Thomas Kramer case, the FEC had evidence that a DNC fundraiser was responsible for soliciting illegal conduit contributions. Mr. Kramer's secretary said that if she was given immunity, she would name that person. The FEC did not pursue it. They did not refer it to the Justice Department so they could pursue it. The DNC fundraiser who is instigating illegal activities gets off scot-free. We have a similar situation with the Castro case. It will become clear during the course of the hearing that instructions for Jorge Castro's illegal contributions were coming from someone associated with the Democrat National Committee. Jorge Castro was getting detailed instructions about which state parties to make contributions to. Calls were being made to take one state off the list and put another on in its place. These directions could have only come from a Democratic Party strategist who knew which states needed money and which didn't. Since the Justice Department decided not to pursue this case, that person gets off scot-free. What we are seeing is a disturbing pattern of Democratic operatives getting mixed up with illegal contributions. If the Justice Department and the Federal Election Commission don't vigorously pursue these cases, we'll wind up with the conduit contributors getting punished but the party operatives behind the contributions getting a walk. This is clearly not acceptable. If political party officials are behind illegal contribution schemes, they must be brought to light and they must be punished. If the Justice Department won't do it, and if the FEC won't do it, then maybe the Congress needs to do it. That's one of the reasons we're holding these hearings. Anyone who has attended these hearings has heard me talk about the unbelievable number of people who have taken the Fifth Amendment or fled the country. Ninety-two people. Many of their pictures are on that wall over there. You can see on that wall of shame uh, photos of the friends and associates of the President who have taken the Fifth and fled the country. This committee has run into a stone wall of stone, stalling and obstruction. The Castro case has been no exception. Once again, we have a key witness take the Fifth to avoid testifying. That person is Charles Intriago. Mr. Intriago is the Castro family's lawyer. He is a DNC trustee. We will introduce into the record today the sheet of instructions, the sheet of instructions that Mr. Intriago faxed to Jorge Castro on how to make these illegal contributions. It details who to make the contribution, contributions to and for how much. We will hear testimony from Jorge Castro that Mr. Intriago called him to change the instructions to take one state off the list and put another state on the list. It is clear that Mr. Intriago was acting as a go-between for the Castro family and the Democrat National Committee. It seems clear that Mr. Intriago could inform us who he was getting these instructions from and whether that person was aware that illegal contributions were being made. Unfortunately, Mr. Intriago is not talking. He has taken the Fifth Amendment one more stone on that wall. What did the Castro family get for their money? 
They got a meeting with a high-level State Department official and other officials to discuss money laundering. They got to attend the President's inauguration. Apparently, Mr. Entriago was angling to be the U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela. Well, that at least didn't happen. It is clear that the only way the American people are going to learn the truth is if we begin to immunize some of these witnesses and compel their testimony. Last week, we voted on immunity for four important witnesses, a close business associate of Ted Siong, two employees of Johnny Chung, and a political associate of Jean and Nora Lum. In each case, in each case, the Justice Department was carefully consulted. In each case, the Justice Department had no objection to immunity. But in each case, every one of my Democrat colleagues voted against immunity. Immunity was blocked and the witnesses will remain silent because of this obstruction. My colleague, Mr. Waxman, has consistently attacked this investigation. He will tell you in a few minutes that I have run a partisan investigation. He will say that I have abused my powers. Of course, none of this is true, but apparently my colleagues on the Democratic side voted against immunity to punish me. But the truth is their votes don't punish me. When they block immunity, they are punishing the American people who have a right to know. They have a right to know what happened. They have a right to know who broke the laws. When you block immunity and you don't allow witnesses to testify, you keep the truth from the American people. Now, my colleague, Mr. Waxman, thinks I have my mind made up. He does not think I'm objective, and that's fine. He has a right to his opinion. But I don't think the American people have their minds made up. Let's let them hear the testimony of these witnesses and make up their own minds. Blocking this testimony by the Democrats only hurts the American people that we were sent here to represent. Ted Siong has been accused of being a Chinese agent. Is that true? Kent Law may be able to shed some light on this. Siong and his family have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to both Democrats and Republicans. This isn't partisan. It affects both parties. Let's give Kent law immunity. The Justice Department doesn't oppose it. Let's let the American people hear this testimony and make up their own minds. We have a lot of good people on this committee, both Republicans and Democrats. I know that everyone on both sides of this committee has been shocked by some of the things that have happened during the last election. I think everyone wants the truth to come out. If you don't like me, if you don't like my style, that's fine. I'll accept that. But you're not punishing me, you're punishing the American people who have a right to know. We're going to vote on immunity for these same four witnesses again next week. And I hope everyone on the committee will think long and hard about their vote over the weekend. Returning to today's hearing, I would like to welcome our witnesses. Mr. Castro will provide a first-hand account of how these contributions were made and why. We have two prosecutors from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. These two gentlemen were involved in prosecuting the Castro case, and they were the people who were in communication with the Justice Department. Uh, welcome, Mr. Castro. I'm glad you're here. Before we hear from you, we will now uh, hear from Mr. Waxman, the ranking minority member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to clarify the record on a couple of points uh, about this investigation. At our last hearing on March 31, I reminded you that your investigation has already cost $6 million of taxpayers' money. You disputed that number and agreed to provide a full accounting of the funds spent by the majority on this investigation by April 3. It's now four weeks later, and you still haven't provided for that accounting. Mr. Chairman, the public does have a right to know all, all, all the information, especially how their dollars are being spent. This is already the most expensive <coughs> congressional investigation in history and one that has produced the least amount of new information. I again ask you to provide to the minority and to the public a precise audit of all the tax dollars you've spent on this investigation since November 1996. Mr. Chairman, by not providing that information, you're punishing the American people. Will you provide it to us? I think it's already a matter of public record, but I will make, uh, make sure that you get uh, a complete accounting of the expenses, sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You've also made it clear that you're intentionally violating the uh, committee's rules and releasing transcripts 
uh, and uh, or recordings of conversations that Webb Hubble had uh, with people uh, on the telephone while he was in prison. It's also clear, however, when we read the newspapers that your staff or you told uh, reporters that you haven't yet released all the uh, most relevant and detailed tapes. Uh, coincidentally, uh, there's a tape that contains some exculpatory information regarding Mr. Hubble and does have specific information that relates to this committee's investigation. Our uh, serious objection to releasing the tapes is that most of these tapes, 99% of them, have nothing to do with this committee's investigation. They're personal, they're private conversations, in many cases intimate conversations that Mr. Hubble is having with his wife. I'm offended at the idea that they would be released. I think it's uh, inconsistent with the rules for the chairman to release those tapes. I think they should be reviewed by the committee and by our subcommittee on uh, documentary, uh, document disclosure. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you're going to be releasing tapes, I hope you'll release the transcript of the September 18, 1996 conversation uh, with appropriate redactions for legitimate privacy concerns. I believe that this is tape 118B. Mr. Chairman, I hope you'll be releasing that tape if you're going to release if others. The, if the gentleman yield briefly, sure. let me just say that we're going to scrutinize very carefully, and we have been, Mr. Hubble's tapes and all these other tapes, and we'll make sure that we don't release anything that's uh, of a personal nature. Now, there may be a tape that there is something on it that's uh, relevant to our investigation we'll have to release, but we're being very careful about uh, uh, getting into the personal aspects of Mr. Hubble's family life. Now, regarding what you're talking about there, uh, that was, give me that one more time. It's uh, tape 118B. It's a, a conversation that Mr. Hubble that had that related directly to this subject of the investigation. And if you're going to be releasing tapes that uh, of any sort, which we don't approve of, you ought to be not uh, releasing a tape that's uh, helpful to Mr. Hubble, not just those that are I'll, I'll selectively harmful. I'll certainly take a look at 118B and see if we can include that. I, I do want to point out, Mr. Chairman, that this whole issue of these tapes came to our attention when we read in the Wall Street Journal about a conversation Mr. Hubble had with his wife about what he was going to eat and how the food uh, was not satisfactory to him and subjects, of course, that have nothing to do with his investigation. Yet, that information has already been released by our subcommittee uh, to the Wall Street Journal and others, I'm sure, will be appearing that have information not related to anything to do with this investigation and that is impersonal. Today, Mr. Chairman, you've also released 60 depositions and interrogatories, but have only provided 34 of these to the minority. The Democratic staff has repeatedly asked your staff for copies of this material which we must receive under the rules, but your staff has refused to provide the information. And I'm providing you a list of uh, 34 depositions and interrogatories uh, we have not received. And I'd like to ask you to direct your staff to provide this information by the close of the business today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, here is this list. Review it with your staff. We're entitled to the information. Uh, under the rules, we request that uh, you comply with the rules. Well, we, we, if the gentleman would yield briefly, we certainly uh, will comply with the rules. And I was just talking to my staff about this. Uh, if, if there has been anything that you haven't received, we'll, we'll uh, make sure you get it right away. It's not intentional if that did occur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to raise a routine factual matter that I believe will be easy for you to correct. There have been, of course, individuals who are not cooperating with your investigation and some have e either assess asserted their Fifth Amendment right under the Constitution uh, or left the country. You've released a list of such individuals and have repeatedly claimed that it's over 90 uh, individuals. Even a quick review of your list, however, indicates obvious inaccuracies. You're still counting Manlin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wong, for an instance, despite the fact that they appeared before our committee and answered every question that any member had to ask of them. Whether they answered it accurately or not is another question, but uh, they have not uh, refused to cooperate. Uh, given that, is there any reason uh, that you would include them on your list of individuals who have left the country or are asserting their Fifth Amendment rights? Uh, I think it's a mistake. I think, in addition, there are at least 20 other individuals who seem to be inaccurately included in your list. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you agree that accuracy in this matter is important, and I'd like to ask you to direct your staff to revise the list accordingly. I'll be very happy, Mr. Waxman, to give you a list, and uh, you can go over it and, and send me corrections if you think they're desired. Uh, if you would yield just a moment. Regarding Manlin Fong and the others that you mentioned, uh, they did take the Fifth Amendment, and we had to immunize them, as you know, before they would testify. That's why they were included on the list. They nevertheless have already testified, so they shouldn't be in the category of people who are not uh, cooperating with this committee. They did cooperate. Um, I, I also want to correct a series of misstatements that have been made about the cooperation you've received from Democrats on this committee. You seem to have forgotten some basic facts, and I want to take a moment to refresh your memory. You might remember that as soon as the committee convened last year, I wrote you and asked that you structure this investigation so that we could work in a bipartisan way and investigate all fundraising abuses. You might also remember that you specifically rejected that request and told me you wanted to pursue your own investigation. You promised to keep me informed of your actions, but you didn't want to work with me or the minority in any formal way. Well, you might also remember that I had, in a New York Times op-ed, which I'll be glad to give to you for your uh, memory to be refreshed, uh, in that uh, New York Times op-ed in February of last year, I called even for an independent counsel to investigate the president and other fundraising abuses and proposed creating a joint House-Senate committee to conduct one comprehensive campaign finance inquiry. It was obvious at the time that the administration wasn't pleased with my decision, but I thought it was the right thing to do, and Republicans didn't waste any time trying to exploit my views on an independent council for their own political purposes. At the same time, the Republican leadership refused to combine the House and the Senate investigations and coordinate their work, uh, which resulted in redundant investigations and a lot of taxpayers' money being wasted, a lot of witnesses having to respond separately to two different committees. In addition, last April, you adopted rules uh, for the uh, conduct of this investigation. It was on a straight party line vote. Uh, it, it, the Democrats all voted against it because the Republicans delegated to you uh, as chairman powers that had never been given to any chairman before it uh, gave you uh, the uh, power to unilaterally go out and issue subpoenas and release information. As a result, uh, we've had uh, over 600 subpoenas issued unilaterally by you, Mr. Chairman, without a concurrence by the Democrats in any way, shape, or form, not even a vote of the committee. Uh, you might also remember that last October, you asked Democrats on this committee to vote for immunity. Well, even though you had never extended any gestures of bipartisanship to us, we agreed, and we immunized three witnesses. We voted for it. Because you are conducting this investigation in an unprecedented way and control all the power yourself, that vote was the only time Democrats had a voice in your investigation. And notwithstanding how partisan you have been, we voted with you. You might understand then, Mr. Chairman, that it is odd, with that factual backdrop, to see you pretend that none of that happened. If you want Democrats to consider your requests for immunity votes, you should go back and review a letter we sent you last October. Uh, all the committee Democrats signed that letter. That letter set out procedural reforms that we believe are necessary for this committee to conduct a fair, bipartisan, and effective investigation. Uh, that letter was sent to you, all the Democrats signed it, and uh, the response we got was, uh, go take a hike, it's a partisan investigation by the Republicans, you were not interested in changing the way the investigation was being conducted. Now today's hearing, today's hearing is about uh, uh, an issue from a 1992 campaign contribution, and I look forward to hearing the testimony that we'll receive. The hearing we had before this one was about a 1994 campaign finance issue, although it seemed to me that what we were supposed to be investigating are abuses from the 1996 election. Now, um, last time you can, 
accused the Federal Election Commission of acting improperly because in their discretion they didn't prosecute a matter that they didn't think was reasonable for them to pursue. Today you're going to accuse the Justice Department of not pursuing a prosecution for a 1992 contribution. Uh, your statements this morning are filled with unsubstantiated allegations, their theories, their accusations. The test ought to be what the facts are, not what the theories are. The test ought to be what the truth is, not what uh, you believe the truth to be. Uh, I now understand what you meant when you said back home that if you could prove 10 percent of what you believe to be true, the president would be out. Uh, but the question is not whether it's 10 percent of what you believe to be true, but whether it's actually true, whether we're really getting to information that is accurate. Uh, this hearing today is unusual because it goes all the way back to 1992. At this rate, Mr. Chairman, it will probably be sometime in June, I expect, that we'll be focusing on the 1960 election, and I suppose the topic will be whether President Kennedy stole that election. I look forward to hearing the testimony today and seeing whether the facts in any way bear out all the accusations that you've made, which I think are unfounded. I yield back the balance of my time. I've just been informed that uh, there's a vote on the floor, and uh, before we start talking to Mr. Castro, I think we probably ought to uh, uh, go and, and make that vote and then come back. So the chair, uh, the committee will stand in recess till we return. The committee will reconvene. Mr. Chairman, uh, before we hear from the witness, uh, during the break, I was informed that two networks played tapes of Webb Hubble in conversations he had from his prison. And, and I'm confused in light of that, the statement you made earlier, that you were going to review these tapes very carefully before they were released. Could you give us an explanation on how these tapes got to the networks and whether uh, they had been reviewed to remove privacy? The, I, I'm pretty sure, and, and the gentleman might double check, uh, during the hearing where you were absent, uh, when um, uh, a number of tapes were uh, entered into the record and then subject for uh, dispersal to, the, to whomever, the media or anybody else in, in the public area, I think those are the tapes that uh, you're referring to. Those are already in the public domain. What I was referring to last night on Larry King Live and today are the tapes that we're reviewing very thoroughly and we're going to make sure, as I said, that personal things are not in there unless, along with them, there's uh, information that's relevant to our investigation, but we're being very careful now. I, I don't know what tapes you're referring to, but I believe they're the ones that uh, previously had been released. Well, I, I don't, I, I checked the transcript of our hearing record very carefully and I don't believe that we ever gave authorization for releasing any tapes, but uh, I can't understand which tapes we, if you think we gave authorization for some and not others, how, how you would delineate those tapes. Maybe you can tell us which ones are already out in the public, which ones you think you had authorization to release. Well, I gave you uh, documents uh, that, that showed that they were put into the record and, and subject to dis, uh, disbursement uh, at our last meeting. Uh, I, I don't think I'll belabor the point, uh, but my staff and your staff, we can get together and show you exactly what tapes were released at that time. Uh, Mr. Castro, would you rise, please? Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Have a seat. Mr. Castro, I understand you have an opening statement. That's correct. Proceed. My name is uh, Jorge Castro Barreto, and I'm currently incarcerated in the Mid-State Correctional Facility. Is that okay? I'm currently incarcerated in the Mid-State Correctional Facility located in upstate New York. I'm serving a sentence with a mandatory minimum term, three and a half years, and a maximum term of ten and a half years in prison. Upon my conviction in New York State Supreme Court of grand larceny and related crimes, I have already served more than two years of that sentence, and I'm currently eligible for work release. 
1992, a person named Charles Intriago, whom I believed to be a prominent, well-regarded attorney, asked me to make certain political contributions. Since Mr. Intriago was a lawyer and family, and my family trusted to represent my family's interests in the United States, and since I believed that he was a knowledgeable, he, that he was knowledgeable about matters of that sort, I did as he asked. A little bit more. All right. I don't have these where I'm incarcerated at, so I'm not used to. <laughs> On September 15, 1992, I drew one check for $5,000 to the Ohio Victory Fund 92 and one check for $20,000 to the DNC Victory Fund 92. Subsequently, Mr. Intriago told me that the Ohio check had not been and would not be cashed and asked me to write a $5,000 check to the Kentucky Democratic Party, which I did on September 29, 1992. Later, Mr. Intiago asked me to write a check, a $5,000 check to the Florida Democratic Party, and I did so on October 13, 1992. Mr. Intiago told me that the Kentucky check would not be cashed, and I asked him why we were doing this, and he told me that that's the way they wanted, they wanted it. I now understand that this conduct may not have been appropriate. I have been told that I've, if I cooperate fully with this committee and testify truthfully, the chairman will make the fact known to the New York State Department of Correction. As I am presently eligible for work release, it is my hope that my voluntary and truthful cooperation will be considered as a factor in deciding whether I should be placed in a work release program. Thank you, Mr. Castro. We'll now proceed with the questioning. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, for the record, I'll take 20 minutes of the allocated 30 minutes now and reserve 10 minutes at the conclusion of members' questioning. I don't understand. You're allocated 30. Oh, you want to yeah. reserve? Uh, Congressman, I was just going to no. take 20 for staff questioning, and then I'll reserve the other 10, perhaps to follow up in, after members' questioning, perhaps not. Well, I thought what we agreed to, was, uh, and the way we've always proceeded, is that we have 60 minutes divided equally be between both sides, and uh, it's up to the chairman if he wants to allocate his time to you, and it's up to me to allocate the time That's fine. on our side. I suppose when we get around to the rounds, people can allocate that time to you at that point. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Waxman. Uh, Mr. Castro, I want to thank you for your cooperation and your appearance before this committee uh, today. With respect to your opening statement, sir, um, clearly those contributions involved foreign money, didn't they? That's correct. And they involved Venezuelan money from your grandfather's companies. That's correct. And in fact, your grandfather, uh, Orlando Castro Lianis, and your uncle, Orlando Castro Castro, were convicted with you in connection with the administration of a bank in Puerto Rico. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, your incarceration now is for bank fraud and larceny. Is that correct? That's correct. And indeed, you were prosecuted by the office of New York City District Attorney Robert Morgenthau. Uh, representatives of his office are here uh, today and will testify later. Uh, is either your grandfather or your uncle those individuals with whom you were convicted, is either one of those gentlemen an American citizen? No, they're not. And with respect to your cooperation with the committee, uh, you understand that your cooperation with state and federal authorities is apparently including cooperation with respect to your testimony as to political contributions of foreign money in 1992. Is that correct? That's correct. And again, Mr. Uh, Castro, as you've noted in your statement, uh, and Mr. Chairman, as Chief Counsel for the Committee and for Congressman Waxman as the ranking minority member, I would just note, uh, Mr. Castro, that you have been advised that uh, the Chairman of this Committee, uh, with a copy to Congressman Waxman, will write a letter uh, on your behalf to the appropriate officials when notified by your attorney at the appropriate time. Do you understand that? I do understand. And, and for the record, I'm sorry, Mr. Austin Campriello from the State of New York is here as your Defense Counsel, Mr. Campriello. Welcome, sir. Thank you. With respect to Mr. Intriago, the Miami attorney whom you just mentioned in your opening statement, Mr. Castro, what relationship did Mr. Intriago have uh, with your family, the Castro family? Mr. Intriago, for many years, was the, the besides being the, the legal advisor to the family, he was the person in the United States that uh, was always asked in every business transactions and every. Uh, I repeat advice that we, that we ever had. 
And I understand that your grandfather is presently incarcerated in a New York State prison, but prior to his conviction and incarceration, he was in fact a resident and a citizen of Venezuela, is that correct? That's correct. And what about your uncle? Was he Venezuelan or Puerto Rican in his residence? Venezuelan. And with respect to uh, your own citizenship, do you have dual citizenship, sir? No, I'm a U.S. citizen. I was born in Miami and I've always been a U.S. citizen. But with respect to your dealings with Mr. Intriago, where were you residing at the time or where were you when Mr. Intriago contacted you? And I'll get into more detail in a minute. I lived in Dominican Republic since I was approximately 10 years old. And with respect to Mr. Intriago's representation of your grandfather's business interest, where are those business interests? Can you repeat that? With respect to Mr. Intriago's representation of your grandfather, Orlando um, uh, Castro, where are his business interests? They were in Venezuela, is that correct? That's correct. And yep. in Puerto Rico? And the Dominican Republic. And is it safe to say that he handled all legal matters, uh, Mr. Intriago handled all legal matters for your grandfather in the United States? That's correct. Uh, with respect to your own uh, political involvement, sir, you're here before this Congressional Committee testifying as to illegal uh, foreign campaign contributions in the 1992 presidential election. As to your own uh, political involvement, have you been politically active yourself, sir? Uh, not in the United States, no. Had you ever made any political contributions in the United States prior to 1992 when requested by Mr. Intriago? No, I have not. Have you made any political contributions since? No, I have not. Uh, in terms of your own personal financial situation in 1992, were you in a financial position uh, to make contributions totaling $25,000 in September of 1992? I was. And with respect to uh, those contributions, again, we'll get into more detail later, but you were in fact reimbursed by a Venezuelan company immediately by your grandfather, correct? That's correct. Uh, do you have any particular interest in politics, apart from the fact that you haven't been a contributor? Have you been active politically in the American political process? Not in the American political process, no. Have you ever voted in an election in the United States? Sir? No, I have not. Uh, directing your attention to uh, 1992, uh, you did in fact write checks out to the Democratic National Committee and you were reimbursed uh, by your grandfather with respect to those uh, contributions. When and how quickly did you determine that you were going to be reimbursed for your contributions? I knew it beforehand. In other words, even before you wrote the checks out, you knew you were going to be reimbursed. That's correct. By your grandfather. I was going to be reimbursed by one of the companies owned by the, by the, uh, by the family, yes. Companies owned by your grandfather. That's correct. And who told you that, sir? Uh, Mr. Intriago. Now, going through the dealings with Mr. Intriago uh, in terms of uh, his relationship with you. Would you de can you determine exactly when you believe you were first contacted by Mr. Intriago with respect to making these contributions? It was uh, in the first week of September, the second week of September of 1992. And where were you at that time? Uh, I believe, according to our notes, around September 15, 1992. I was in the Dominican Republic, my office. And uh, how long had you been in the Dominican Republic at your office? Were you working there for that period of time in September of 1992? Yes, I was. So and did you contact Mr. Intriago or did he contact you? He contacted me. And exactly what occurred when he contacted you? I gather he was calling from the United States? Called from Miami from his office and he spoke to me and told me what, uh, what I was supposed to do. And exactly what did he say to you when he called, sir? He told me that uh, there was some certain political contributions to be made. At that time, he, by, over the phone, he told me the, the, where to write the checks to. Did he make any specific reference to a political party or to President Clinton? Not President Clinton, but the Democratic Party. He just told me the name of, of to, where to, to what entities to write the checks to, and I told him to fax me a document because I was always a very busy person, so I wouldn't make a mistake. I'll, I'll get to the facts in a minute, sir, but let me just ask you something else. The, the representation then was not with respect to the presidents or at that time, uh, President uh, or Governor Clinton's election campaign, but was the reference to the Democratic Party? That's correct. And did he make any reference to whether or not your grandfather was to make these contributions? In what sense? I mean, when he called you, you weren't politically active. Uh, according to the, the notes the committee has, it, you've indicated that uh, there was some representation that your grandfather wanted you to make contributions at this time. That's correct. And uh, what was the basis of Mr. Intriago having that authority to tell you that your grandfather wanted to make contributions? Uh, just knowledge that uh, of, of what he, he, he meant or represented to the family group. 
was there any discussion about any other member of your family also being utilized to make contributions? Yes, my uncle, which he lived in Dominican Republic with me. And also your aunt, I believe, is that correct? That, that his wife. And, and what is her name, sir? Maria Castro. And uh, is she also a U.S. citizen? I believe so. Was there any discussion about the, the importance of your and your aunt being a U.S. citizen with respect to the making of these contributions? It wasn't a, a, a thorough discussion. It was just uh, curiosity. And uh, when I asked, I was told that because I was a U.S. citizen, and that's the way it had to be done. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Castro, when, he, when Mr. Intriago asked you to make these contributions, did he ask you, did he tell you why? I mean, you know, $50,000 in contributions, um, there's got to be some reason. Why did Mr. Intriago ask for that money for the DNC? It's, I know $50,000 sounds like a lot of money, and it probably is. But coming from Mr. Intriago, it had the authorization from my grandfather. I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to question. And, uh, but he, so he did not give you any reason. He just said he wanted $50,000. Oh, well, I was told that because I was a U.S. citizen and it couldn't be done any other way. That, that was basically the reason. But there was reason. No, no reason given? No. Uh, in your opening statement, you said uh, that's the way they want it. That's correct. Did Mr. Entriago ever define who they was? No, he did not. Did you ever ask him who they was? No, I did not. I just thought it was the Democratic Party because that's what we were writing the checks to. Okay. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, looking at, uh, you have an exhibit book there before you, Mr. Campriello, uh, with Mr. for Mr. Castro to review, and there's also a, a TV monitor here in the hearing room. Uh, first of all, looking at exhibit VEN 4 for the members of the committee, uh, and then also VEN 16, looking at VEN 4, that's in fact the check you made payable to the Democratic National Committee for $20,000. Is that correct? That's correct. That's and, correct. And then VEN 16, uh, contains a copy of another uh, to the Ohio Victory Fund for $5,000. Do you see that? Yes. How quickly were you to be reimbursed for these checks? How, how, how quickly? quickly were you to be reimbursed for these checks? I actually wasn't given a time span because I had the money in my, I had money in my account, or if not, I, I wasn't going to starve if I didn't receive the money immediately, but I was, I was, I was promised and told that I was going to be reimbursed. It wasn't going to come out of my personal um, Did you take, you mentioned a, the, a fax communication and, and taking steps to make sure that you had the instructions correct? Correct. Um, looking at uh, VEN2, exhibit VEN2, is that in fact a copy of the fax communication which you received from Mr. Intriago? Uh, yes. Yes, that's correct. And you, in fact, were in the Dominican Republic when you received that fax? Yes. Uh, and then uh, I note that there is, uh, uh, for the record, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Waxman, these are among documents that we were provided by uh, Mr. Morgenthau's office. Um, I noticed uh, there's a Spanish writing at the bottom, so perhaps if we can go over to Exhibit VEN3 uh, in the exhibit books for the members of the committee. There is a translation of the Spanish at the bottom of that exhibit, and I want to make sure we have that correct, Mr. Castro. According to the committee staff, that Spanish sentence reads uh, to the effect, I want you to send me these today by Federal Express. Is that a correct translation? That's correct. And do you know what the urgency was, why Mr. Intriago wanted these checks? I don't know what the urgency was at that time. On, Everything on. we did was urgent, so it was just another... But for some reason, there was some urgency on September 15, 1992, as to these checks. Is that correct? There was an urgency, but I repeat, everything we did was always in urgencies, and I wasn't surprised that this was, had to be done yesterday. Looking at uh, exhibits VEN 2 and 3, the fax communication, did you have communications with any other member of your family as to the checks to be prepared by your Aunt Maria, uh, $20,000 to the DNC Victory Fund? A, a separate from your check, as well as uh, $5,000 to the Maryland Victory Fund 92. Did you talk with any other member of your family? After I received the phone call, I, sp I spoke to my uncle, and uh, I told him what to do because I was told what to do, and that's the way it was done. And did you also explain that this has been authorized by your grandfather and that they were to be reimbursed as well? That's correct. Now, looking at uh, then reviewing Exhibit VEN 6, and then VEN 5 in the exhibit book for the members of the committee. 
They are, in fact, the checks, copies of checks prepared by your Aunt Maria. Do you see those? Yes, I do. Uh, and are they consistent with the instructions you gave her and uh, your uncle as to $5,000 to the uh, Maryland Victory Fund and $20,000 to the Democratic National Committee? That's correct. At any point in time, did you have specific discussions with Mr. Intriago about the illegality of this process? At that time? Yes. No. no, uh, no. You, you knew that they were using you as an American citizen to make foreign campaign contributions. Did you yourself know that this was illegal at that time? No, I did not. Looking uh, at back at uh, Exhibit VEN 16, which has two checks on that exhibit, uh, Mr. Intriago. Mr. Castro. Uh, I'm Mr. Castro, excuse me, sir. I apologize. Uh, I, I won't make that mistake again. Uh, I apologize. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to defame you in that fashion, okay. sir. I'm sorry. It's okay. um, with respect to the $5,000 check to the Ohio Victory Fund, uh, for the record, that check was never, in fact, cashed, was oh, it? That was not cashed. Y you sent it to Mr. Intriago, but it was never cashed, according to your records. That's right. Now, looking at the second check on the bottom of VN uh, 16, uh, the second check to the Kentucky State Party, I note that that's dated about two weeks later. Do you recall the circumstances surrounding your preparing that second check to another state Democratic Party? Yeah, he called me again. He, I, Mr. Intriago, Mr. Intriago called, called me again, and I would say no more than a week later. And he gave me instructions to change the check from Ohio to Kentucky. I didn't, I didn't receive a fax for that because it was quite obvious. It was just a change of state. And you can identify your handwriting on both of those checks. You, in fact, prepared those checks, That's correct? That's correct, yes. Then, in fact, Mr. Intriago, according to our interview of you, uh, uh, Mr. Castro, and, and for the record, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Waxman, uh, Mr. Castro was interviewed uh, jointly by counsel for both majority and minority yesterday. Isn't that correct, Mr. Castro? That is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Intriago called you again, and if you look at Exhibit VEN 7 in your uh, exhibit books, this check is made payable to the Florida Democratic Party, and it's dated October 13, 1992. That's correct. Do you see that check, sir? That, yes, yes, I do. Did, did you, uh, sort of following up on what uh, Chairman Burton asked, did, did you went ahead and you wrote this check. Did you ask Mr. Intriago why you were getting these phone calls in terms of making changes as to what state you were to make these checks payable to? The first change from the Ohio to Kentucky, I didn't bother to ask, but when the third call came in that changed another check to Florida, I asked him, and that's when I was told by him that it was not a big deal, it's just the way they wanted, they and, wanted to be done. And again, did, uh, he, did, he, Mr. Intriago, did not indicate who they were? No, he did not. Do you have any knowledge of whom at the, with whom at the Democratic National Committee or any state democratic structure uh, Mr. Intriago was dealing with? No, I do not. Uh, looking at VEN 7, just for a minute if I can, Mr. Castro, I note that there is handwriting on the top of that check. That's correct. Uh, is that your handwriting at the top no, of the check? No, it's sir? not. Uh, it, I note that there's an address, a Florida address. That's not your handwriting, but is that a correct Florida address for you at that time? I can't read the first part where it says before Brickle, but if it's 520, it is mine. It looks like 501, which is not mine, but if it says 520, it's mine. What about the telephone number at the top there? No, that's not my telephone number. In, in fact, to your knowledge, is that Mr. was that Mr. Intriago's telephone number? That's correct. Um, do you know, have any knowledge as to why his telephone number would be listed on your check in his handwriting? No. I Just so the record is clear, uh, the checks to uh, Ohio and Kentucky reflected uh, by VEN 16 were never, in fact, cash, correct? It, the, the two checks that oh, were ultimately were cashed were, not. were the check for $20,000 to the DNC and $5,000 to the Kentucky State Democratic Party. That was not cashed. Okay. What was the total amount of your contributions for which you were reimbursed? $25,000. Uh, $25,000. And uh, to your knowledge, your aunt was also reimbursed for her checks? That's correct. Now, in terms of the reimbursement, uh, looking at uh, VEN 15, for the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Castro, in fact, VEN 15, exhibit VEN 15, reflects a wire transfer into your account for the $25,000, and it's from Inversiones Latinvin, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That is correct. And what is that entity, sir? 
That's a premium finance company we owned in Caracas, Venezuela at that time. That is a premium finance company in Venezuela? That's correct. And who owns that company, sir? It was owned by my grandfather and the family. Does it derive any income in the United States? No, it does not. And does this uh, Venezuelan company have any U.S. operations? No. As to the activities of, of your grandfather and family with any members of the Clinton administration, uh, do you have any knowledge of any meetings attended by your family, particularly your grandfather, after uh, these contributions were made, after President Clinton's election in 1992? Yes. Uh, and I to do. your knowledge, how many were there any trips made to Washington? After he was president or? After President Clinton was elected, yes. One trip after he was elected. In oh, fact, he, no, no, two trips after he was elected, one for the inauguration and the other one when he visited the White House. And with respect to the inauguration, you and your family attended one of the inaugural balls, is that correct? Not the inaugural ball, it was the big, uh, the small gathering in front of the Capitol Hill with about three million other people. Well, th there have been, a f for the record, there have been a few Republicans who have also been pretty far away from the action as well during the okay. events of the inauguration. But I mainly want to uh, uh, focus in on uh, the second family visit in October of 1993. Uh, your grandfather and you and others of your family uh, came to Washington in October of 1993, correct? That's correct. And uh, do you have knowledge of your grandfather and Mr. Intriago being invited to a White House reception for national Democratic National Committee donors? I know he was invited to the White House. I didn't know the purpose of the trip and who invited him. I believe exhibit in the books of VEN1, as well as a, a, a blow up that's here in the committee room, that is in fact a picture of your grandfather with President Clinton, is that correct? That's correct. Do you have any knowledge as to whether he was directly received an invitation to that event? I don't know if he directly received it, but uh, he was given and told in front of me by Charlie and Tiago when we were at the lobby of the hotel here in Washington. And uh, do you know why he would be on some list? Because your grandfather's name would not appear or should not appear on any contribution list because you're the one technically according to the records that made the contribution. That's correct. Uh, do you know why he would be attending that? No. Uh, with Just directing your attention to exhibit VEN-27, uh, this is a letter which was provided to the committee pursuant to a subpoena issued to the Democratic National Committee, and it's a letter from an official of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, do you have any knowledge of your grandfather's association with any officials of the Democratic National Committee? I was, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I was I'm asking in light of this letter to Mr. Intriago, which made reference to your grandfather, I'm just asking if you have any personal knowledge of your grandfather's association with any officials at the Democratic National Committee, apart from Mr. Intriago having those contacts. No, I, do, I don't think he had any other contact. And then finally, sir, in, in October of 1993, um, when your family was here in Washington, there was a meeting at the State Department, is that correct? That's correct. And with what was the purpose of that meeting at the State Department? We just uh, came and visited, I don't remember the name of the person that we visited, at that time, and uh, we were just discussing of events that were occurring in Venezuela and the financial uh, district in Venezuela regarding our family's business and so on and so forth. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I see my 20 minutes is out, and I'll reserve yeah. the other 10 oh, minutes. The, the 10 minutes. The Thank you, sir. Reserved. Mr. Waxman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Castro, I, I want to review uh, and summarize some of the testimony that you've given today, and I want to make sure it's correct. Uh, in September 1992, Charles Intriago called you and asked you and your aunt to uh, make a political contributions. Is that right? He, he called me. I told my aunt afterwards. Okay. And you knew Mr. Intriago because he was your grandfather's attorney and advisor. Is that correct? That's correct. And according to your testimony, Mr. Intriago told you that you would be reimbursed. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you have any evidence aside from your own testimony that Mr. Intriago knew you would be reimbursed? That, I, that he knew that I would be reimbursed? Uh, how, how, uh, the only evidence we have that you were going to be reimbursed is your statement here. Right. Is there any other evidence of that? Just, I can tell you that I wouldn't have given $25,000 to the Democratic, the Republican, or any other committee if I wouldn't have been reimbursed. I had no, no interest in the United States, no business 
things in the United States to give out $25,000 of my personal amount. But your uh, grandfather's attorney and political advisor sent you a fax. That's and correct. On that fax, he said, I want you to write checks to the following Democratic Party organizations. Correct. And you did it. Yep. Did he ever ask you to write checks for any other purpose? No. Any business purposes? No, but I did give him $100,000 about a year afterwards. And uh, we, I, I, I do have that fax somewhere. My attorneys probably have them. I gave him $100,000 that were instructed by my grandfather directly for personal purposes. So it was, it was nothing out of this world. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to put in the record a, a letter from uh, Robert mm -hmm. Plotkin, the law firm of Paul Hastings, Janowski, and Walker. They represent uh, Charles and Triago. And, and it's a letter uh, to you. And uh, he, he says, Dear Chairman Burton, I'm counsel to Charles Antriago. According to press releases issued by the committee, as well as news reports and editorials, the committee's hearing on April 30, 1998, will accuse my client of campaign law violations, charges that he vigorously denies. So this letter, and there's a statement attached to it from Mr. Antriago's lawyer says Mr. Antriago denies the allegations again. If, if the, uh, uh, we will allow this in the record, but let me just point out that Mr. Antriago has taken the Fifth Amendment. But his, but his attorney is, his attorney is uh, giving you a statement that he's denying it and he's, I guess, refusing to answer further questions. He's denying it, but he's taking the Fifth Amendment. We've asked him to appear and he won't okay. do it. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Antriago denies that he told you you're going to get reimbursed. You say that you were going to be reimbursed. So basically it comes down to your word whether or not you're telling us the truth. Isn't that correct? I'm here. He's not here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Castro, why are you currently in prison? Why? I was convicted in Manhattan of uh, grand larceny and scheme to defraud. Uh, let me ask you directly, Mr. Castro. D do you believe that you are guilty of the crimes you've been convicted of? I took this matter to trial and I was convicted by 12 New York citizens, and I, I live with that. Your uncle, your uncle Orlando Castro Castro mm -hmm. and your grandfather Orlando Castro Llanos were also convicted of bank fraud, weren't they? That's correct. Now, before the three of you were prosecuted by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, your family controlled the Banco Progreso Internacional in Puerto Rico, is that correct? That is correct. In fact, you served as president of that bank, didn't you? That's correct. How old were you when you were, uh, became president of the Banco Progreso Internacional? I would say 25, 26 years old. Uh, here's what Assistant DA Richard Price said about you, and I'm quoting him. That's right. Simply put, these defendants were individuals who thought they could fool other people, their employees, their customers, their regulators, and their auditors, end quote. Do you think that's a fair description of you? That's what the prosecutor says, and that's what's taken a trial. I won't, I'm not going to comment about it after it's done. So, According to the prosecutors, you took $300,000 from the bank for your personal use. I understand that you bought a yacht, repaired your executive jet, and purchased a number of other luxuries. In other words, you were accused of taking your customers' deposits and spending them to live a lavish lifestyle. Is it correct? Is it correct that I was accused of that? Is it I was accused of that, and I was convicted of that. But you're not admitting it. Admitting that it was done. Yeah. The members of the jury found that it was true. But you don't. You don't. You don't admit that you took bank money and used it for your yacht, your jet, and other luxuries. You deny it. Yeah, it goes further than that. It's more complicated than just accepting that that was done. But that's what's, that was the, what the indictment originally was brought up by the Manhattan prosecutors. And I was convicted of it. But you were convicted of it. Yes. My question, and you can't be tried again on the same offense, so don't worry about what you say. But what I want to know is, did you take money from the bank and use it for your own personal purposes? Uh, yes. Let's just say yes. It's all right. I'm in jail anyhow. Uh, Mr. Castro, we spoke uh, to your grandfather's attorney who told us that your grandfather fired you when he found out that you had been stealing from the bank. 
He also told us that you blamed this on Mr. Intriago because it was Mr. Intriago who showed your grandfather the audit that proved that you had been using the bank's deposits for these personal luxuries. Would you like to respond to that? That I would be, that I would bl be blaming Mr. Intriago for what? For this? Well, he said that you blame Mr. Intriago for your grandfather firing you when you were no, no, 25 that's not years old president of the bank and used money for your luxury. I don't blame Mr. Intriago for anything that was ever done. I didn't like him professionally, that I would admit, but I wouldn't blame him for anything. And you, uh, you're not hostile to, to him because your grandfather fired you? No, of course not. I don't think he had anything to do with it. Uh, you, you talked to uh, the staffs of our committee and you told the committee staff, at least I understand that you did, you didn't really care for Mr. Intriago. Is that a correct statement? I'm sorry, could you? Did you tell the staff when they interviewed you that you didn't care for Mr. Intriago? No, I never did. Professionally, I, I was friends with him. I, we had Marlin tickets together in the baseball stadium. We had dinner once in a while, but professionally, I don't think he was worth what he was selling to my grandfather and my family. Your grandfather's attorney suggested that you may be implicating Mr. Intriago as a way to get even. What do you, what, to get how even would you with respond him? to that? Yeah. To get even with Charlie? I have nothing against him. I don't have to get even with him or anybody. So it's not a personal, it's not a personal thing between him or any other person that I can think of. After you were convicted of the, of the bank charges, right. You told the district attorney you wanted to cooperate in exchange for a recommendation that you get a lenient sentence. Isn't that correct? That is correct. It was then that you decided to accuse your grandfather of reimbursing your political contributions. Is that correct? Accuse? I didn't accuse my grandfather of anything. You didn't accuse your grandfather of reimbursing the money that you contributed? I didn't accuse him. I just said that I was reimbursed by him in one of, my, in one of the companies. I didn't accuse him of doing anything of that sort. Accusing is admitting that something is wrong and, and... Well, you're here today to tell us that money you contributed to the Democratic Party was reimbursed to you by your grandfather. That's correct. Okay. That was first mentioned by you after you were convicted of bank fraud, and you uh, did it in the context of getting a, a more lenient sentence. Is that right? You were trying to be helpful... To myself. For yourself. That's correct. So instead of facing 40 years in prison, you got a sentence of three and a half years. That's correct. And uh, I guess this is a question. Should this fact affect your credibility? That in what sense? Well, that you came up with the story about getting reimbursed. It's not a story. It's a story. It may, may it be true or not true, but it's a story. You, you would say it, presumably it's a truthful story. The only thing I can say, Mr. Waxman is that the gentleman that is saying is denying this is taking the Fifth Amendment, which I didn't know, and he's not here to say the truth or not. Where is your See, grandfather? Where is your grandfather? He's, ser he's serving time in, in, in a correctional facility. Uh, you got a, a more lenient sentence because you were willing to come forward and talk about this campaign contribution when you were originally sentenced. Now, Chairman Burton has told you that he'll write a letter on your behalf to get you released on a work release program. Which, I'm, here which I'm already eligible for. You're uh, eligible for it, but it's correct. still a question of discretion. And the chairman has offered to help you get that work release as, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 a reward for helping the committee get this information. Any letter that's been s that is always sent to a correctional facility or parole board's help. So that's an incentive. Did Chairman Burton promise to help you get out of jail before you agreed to come before the committee? No, I was never promised anything. Would you have agreed to appear today if he had not promised to help you? Maybe. Maybe? Yes. Maybe. Well, I didn't get promised anything, first of all, but I, maybe I would, I would have probably been here anyhow. But on the other hand, you, you thought it might help you? Yeah, of course. Um, when this investigation uh, began last year, Chairman Burton told us this committee would be, quote, investigating all possible mass, investigating a possible massive scheme of funneling millions of dollars into f in foreign money to the U.S. electoral system, and that we are investigating allegations that the Chinese government 
at the highest levels decided to infiltrate our political system. That's a quote. I didn't read it as well as I might have, but the chairman said that's what we're doing. We're going to look at this massive scheme of contributions from Chinese government and people at the highest levels uh, trying to infiltrate our political system. Do you have any uh, evidence of a massive scheme to funnel millions of dollars into the U.S. elections? Do I have any evidence? Yeah. No, I do not. Okay. Do you have any evidence about a Chinese government decision to infiltrate our political system? No, I do not. Do you have any evidence that the Democratic Party or the Clinton-Gore campaign knew that you were going to be reimbursed for your contribution or that the money came from outside the United States? No. In fact, you've made this uh, contribution because you are a U.S. citizen and it would appear to them that this was a legal contribution. Is that correct? Appear to whom? Well, it would appear to the Democratic Party or President Clinton or Clinton-Gore campaign or anybody who got your money that you were a U.S. citizen writing a check to the Democratic Party. That That's correct. On the surface, to them, it would appear to be legal. That's correct. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I'll reserve the balance of my time. And Mr. Well, let me, let me yield to Mr. Lantos if he wants to pursue questions at this point, then uh, go on to other members. Thank you very much. I want to discuss this uh, promised letter from Mr. Burton. Um, I'm advised that uh, there was a discussion between your attorney and uh, the majority's attorney during the course of your deposition with respect to that letter. And Mr. Bennett assured your attorney that Mr. Burton will write a letter that would facilitate your release. Were you present during that discussion? Excuse me, there was no deposition, so I don't, I'm there not sure we know when. There was an interview. Did you have any discussion? Did you, were I you met present Mr. at I any discussion during the course of which your attorney and Mr. Bennett discussed the letter by Mr. Burton? I met Mr. Bennett yesterday in I uh, understand that. Was there any discussion of a letter Mr. Burton was going to write on your behalf during that meeting? No. Yesterday? No. There was nothing about talked about that. There was no discussion of any letter. It was a discussion he they said that the chairman and somebody of the Democratic side would write letters to the correction department saying that I was here and I was saying the truth, but nothing more than that. Who from the Democratic side was going to sign that letter? No, I don't know. I have no idea. Who said that someone from the Democratic side would write a letter? I don't know. There was seven people in that room. I don't remember. Was there a letter discussed during that no, discussion? No, there was not. Well, you just said a moment ago that Mr. Burton and someone it from... It was referenced to, because I am very interested in the letter. So that's my main objective, is the letter. Obviously. But a minute ago you said there was a reference to a letter that would be sent by Mr. Burton and someone on the Democratic side? That's correct. Who, who said that, that someone on the Democratic side would sign a letter? Hmm? I want to sound like I'm lying. Just tell me. No one in the Democratic side said anything, or I don't remember who said it exactly, or maybe I heard things. I'm hearing, maybe I'm hearing too many things. So you think this, right. this may not have happened at all? No, no, I do remember talk, uh, not a discussion about any letter, but it was talked, it was mentioned. That is correct. Mr. Burton will write a letter. I don't know who would write the letter. I have no idea who's going to write a letter. I don't know where the letter is going to go to. I don't know who's going to handle it. I have no idea. Well, a minute ago you said something very different, Mr. Castro. You want to consult with your attorney? I don't know what I said. Right. I, right. I know I'm going to get a letter, but I don't know if it's Mr. Burton who's going to sign it or Mr. Bennett who's going to sign it. Or they're going to send it to New York, or where, I don't know where they're going to send it to who. I have no idea who the letter is going to be sent to. I know it's going to be sent to the New York State Department of Corrections, but to who, I don't know. Now, 
Mr. Intriago, who is uh, the, the attorney for your grandfather, was w the attorney for Who was the attorney, that's correct. <clears throat> Did he indicate to you that he's acting on behalf of uh, the Clinton-Gore campaign? At that time? Yes. I don't know if he said the Clinton-Gore campaign or the Democratic campaign. I, I don't remember. It was six years ago. Just, I don't know. Do you have any personal knowledge that the Democratic National Committee advised Mr. Intriago to obtain a contribution from, from us? No, I have no knowledge of that. So the only contact you had with respect to this contribution was Mr. Intriago? That's correct. <coughs> you said earlier in your testimony that you had adequate resources to write such checks. That is correct. Can you give us a ballpark figure of what your assets were at the time? I don't remember. I have no idea. Well, was it a million dollars or less or more? Or less or more. Well, what, what do you think it was? Uh, we include what? Liquid assets or stock assets? Maybe more. You know, I find it remarkable that you can't remember the discussion you had yesterday, but you have a vivid recollection of a discussion you had five years ago or six years ago. Could you explain that discrepancy to us? Well, what is to remember of yesterday that's so memory lapsing? Well, it relates. I was asked questions. There was four members of one side there, two members of the other side. And that was basically, they were asking, saying, asking me questions, and I was answering them. Well, you raised the issue of the letter being sent by Mr. Burton and someone on the Democratic side. We didn't raise that question. You did, just right. a couple of minutes ago. Well, presumably you remembered it from your conversation yesterday. That's correct. So there was such a discussion yesterday. A letter was mentioned. We, there was a letter mentioned because I have asked my attorney many, many times about letters and things like that. I'll be glad to hear. I just wanted to uh, raise a point here. I, I asked my lawyers who work for us on this committee, wh why did Mr. Intriago take the Fifth Amendment? And the answer they got back from Mr. Intriago's lawyer, I presume, was that even though the statute of limitations has passed in terms of any offense that might have been committed, he could still be prosecuted uh, for some conspiracy charge or something like that. Uh, not, not that he said he was guilty, but that he could be prosecuted. People have a, a right under the Constitution of the United States not to come in and give evidence that, against themselves or to answer questions then have people try to use that evidence in some way or other. Uh, Mr. Intriago didn't come here because he didn't think it would do him any good. Mr. Castro is here because he thinks this might do him a lot of good. I do want to read the statement, if the gentleman would just permit, because I think we ought to have it, not just in the record, but people ought to know about it in the audience. Uh, this is a statement to the committee by Robert Plotkin, counsel for Charles A. Intriago dated April 30, 1998. Charles Intriago is a private citizen who during the 1992 presidential election exercised his fundamental right under the U.S. Constitution to make a campaign contribution from his own personal funds. He also solicited contributions from a number of well-off American citizens with whom he was acquainted and who he believed had the personal financial capability to make such contributions. As a consequence of those activities, he now finds himself unwilling, unwillingly drawn into a nasty and vindictive political conflict that is unfettered by rules of fairness and is immune from the laws of defamation. Mr. Intiago is not a government official. He has never held a high elected or appointed government position. He has never been an employee of or consultant to the Democratic National Committee. He is not a friend or associate of the president, the vice president, or any other high-ranking Democratic Party official. He has not applied for, been interviewed for, or considered a government job. He has never had nor sought a government contract. Mr. Intriago simply is a respected private lawyer with a previously unblemished record of conduct. On the other hand, Jorge Castro Barreiro, Mr. Intriago's principal accuser, is a convicted felon who left 
behind him a wake of corruption in the Dominican Republic. Indeed, it was Mr. Intriago who first learned of and, and disclosed Castro Barreto's wrongdoing, which led to his ultimate termination from the family's business. Jorge Castro Barreto has a vested interest in inventing things about Mr. Intriago in order to curry favor with New York City prosecutors and return to his several homes in Santo Domingo. This testimony, in quotes, is well suited for a committee whose basic investigative tactics include leaks, smears, and innuendos. The committee's sanctimonious use of legitimate government authority to obtain illegitimate political advantage has now claimed Mr. Intriago's reputation as its most recent victim. This is what Mr. Intriago's lawyer has written to us. I, I, since he makes an accusation about you, do you want to respond to it in any way? Uh, to be fair, do you want to say anything in response to this? Response to, to what I just read from Mr. Intriago. First of all, he had nothing to do with discovering anything on my behalf that it would affect my position in any bank or any family business that I had. That I don't know how it came up because it's not true. You don't think he told your grandfather that you were running the bank into the ground and using of course money not. for personal purposes? No, I think it's. I think that's coming up now. He's saying that now to create a an atmosphere of of uh, revenge or hostility, but it's not true. Well, your grandfather did fire you from the bank the presidency, didn't he? Of the of Puerto Rico, I was president still of the Bank of Dominican Republic. So if, if Charlie had so much information of one bank, why didn't he have so much information of the other bank? Thank we're you, still Mr. going to baseball game together, so if we were so hatred, you have to ask him that. Well, he, his statement speaks for itself, and okay. I just want to give you a chance to respond. Thank you, Mr. Miller. <coughs> you were prosecuted by the Manhattan District Attorney's <coughs> Office. Me, uh, I, I just would you? like to finish this just question, if I may. Yeah, that's correct. You know what the political affiliation of the Manhattan District Attorney is? I have no idea. You have no idea? No. He's a very prominent Democrat. Mr. Morgenthau? Yes. Francis, I want to yield to you. Mr. Castro, when did you first, uh, uh, when did it first come to your attention that uh, you were actually involved in a potential uh, violation of campaign contribution laws. When did you first realize this, and how did you realize it? When I was uh, in the middle of the material that was given to us for our trial. So this would have been in, in February of 1997, last year, about 14 months ago. No, it would have been uh, the end of, would have been the fall of 1996. Okay, the fall of 1996. How did this information come to your attention? Did your attorneys give it to you? Did Mr. Serrago give it to you? Who, how did you get it? It was given uh, to us by pro the Mr. Morgenthau's office as part of the discovery material, I think is what they call it. Okay, this is the very first time in your life that you learned of this, that your attorney in Miami had five years before advised you to commit a crime he didn't advise right. me to commit any crime. Well, you learned that it is a crime if you uh, uh, improperly give foreign money to a campaign. I learned that when I was in looking at these documents, and I asked right. my attorney at that so, time. So I returned in 1996, late 1996, for the very first time in your life, you learned that your attorney, some four, uh, four years before, had advised you improperly to participate in, the, in, in a conspiracy to commit a fraud, a fraud and a crime on the Federal Election Act of the United States. Is that correct? I learned that in 96 when I was in jail. That's correct. That's right. Now, at that time, was Mr. Interago representing you still, or was he? No. Oh. Okay. Are you still seeing him on a friendly uh, well, basis? I'm, you go to the ball game together still? I'm, uh, I've been in jail for two years, so it's quite far from... Do, do you ever hear from him? Do you write to him? or do you? Never. Okay. Now, have you talked to your attorneys about this? About what? Your present attorneys about this situation? Which I, I situation don't know that we really of the advice received in that. by a lawyer to commit a crime? Well, I want to know is, did you sue him? 
You have a statute of limitation. Did you no. bring disbarment proceedings or sue Mr. Indirago? Of course, no. no. Why? Why? I don't, I don't see a reason why to. He, he, he committed probably one of the greatest torts a lawyer can commit against his client to advise him. him to commit a crime. That's up to him. What do you mean it's up to him? You're the guy doing time. I don't have anything against him. I don't you, have anything you, against Charlie and Triago. I would, I would not. So you're not offended what he told you to do, and you didn't mind that he told you to do something that you now consider improper? Uh, offended? In a sense, I would say yes, because I was told to do something at that time which we thought it was very normal, and, and then we found out it, was, it wasn't normal. But to take that to a level of lawsuit and disbarment and legal process, I wouldn't do it. Oh, I see. What, 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 what's our recourse now? The statute of limitations on all this is run. It's run on you conveniently at the end. That's when the information was coming to the Justice Department. You've taken no action against your attorney. You have a clear action against him. You've brought no proceedings against him. So he's po possibly still advising people out there, possibly, to do the same thing he advised you to do in 92. That could be. And you feel, as an American citizen, no compunction to stop that activity. The last two or three years, I've gone through so many hardship and lost so many money and spent so much time in jail. How old are you? 30 years old. And, and my you, main you really do have my a wife and my kids, you not really Charlie or whatever Charlie you, does or he's still doing. You really have a tough life. $350,000 to fix your, your luxury aircraft and the yacht and transferring, participating in the transfer of $13 million of depositors' accounts. You're really under a hardship. And instead of getting 40 years, you got three years, and you're ready to get out. If only Willie Sutton had known about you. He didn't have to use a gun. Do you know who Willie Sutton is? No. Nope. He's a very famous bank robber. He made the mistake of going into banks with guns. You, made the mis you, you didn't make that mistake. You went in as an officer of a bank and defrauded your depositors, That's and therefore opinion. defrauded the United States government. But you seem to be without remorse. I mean, Mr. Waxman asked you... Remorse in what sense? Well, did you commit this crime or didn't you? I stated, and if you look at the transcripts look, of... I know you were indicted and you were convicted. I'm not asking you the formal process of the law. You're asking the state of New York to exonerate your fee. You're asking this committee chairman to recommend that you're so helpful. And you can't tell us straightforward on the record, did you or did you not commit the crime? I feel sorry for everybody who lost their money. I told that to the sentencing judge. I feel sorry to all the employees that lost their jobs, and that's as much as I can say. That, you, you just feel sorry for people who lost their jobs and the depositors lost their money. Do you feel that you committed the act you were convicted of? Or are you improperly incarcerated in New York, in your estimation? Seems like the simplest question I've ever asked. It's not a that simple, sir. It's not that simple when you have a family out there with wife and kids, and you're coming on in front of, uh, of millions of people on national TV. It's not that simple. And you're Especially claiming when you've been in jail for two years. You're singularly claiming as a convicted felon that a reputable attorney is, for all purposes we know, in Miami, uh, it, it conspired with you to commit a crime of the, against the United States government. And you don't find that's offensive at all and take no action to prevent that from happening in the future. But you can't reconcile in your own mind something you, you were convicted that could have given you 40 years mm -hmm. and by this soft shuffle got yourself down to three and a half years and after only one month or one year after conviction are getting the con no, chairman year, of this no, committee I've been two years to get in jail. you released. Two years I've been in jail, not one year. Two years. Yeah, one that day was in jail prior is to hard the, enough. That was prior to the conviction, Mr. Castro. You've only been in jail one year since you've been convicted. The I've fact been, is you were, you were held that's, in that's such incorrect. high bail. That's incorrect. I've been in jail since April of 1996. We are now in May or April, late April of 98. That you mean I'm, I'm mistaken here with the committee that tells me that you were convicted in February 97? I spent all that time since the, since the day of the indictment, the day of the arrest. I was, I was denied bail, and that's I right. was 
in jail. The, the state April of 19th. New York didn't think they could allow to put you out on bail because what you said is you have no association with the United States and you can't wait to get out of jail. Use this committee to get you out of jail and get out of this country. I'm going to do a work release right away as, as it is. I'm going to do a work release as it is. as the program of the, Nas of the New York State. Will that be cleaning the, the yacht or the jet expired. plane? The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Horn, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, I'm sort of bemused by some of the actions we've heard here in the last 15 minutes, and uh, it sounds like they're the defense counsel for Mr. Intriago. I congratulate you for having the guts to come here when you've got this wall of shame of people that take the fifth, leave the country, and don't cooperate with us, and stay, just like, as I've said before, the mafia. And you're a brave person to come here and take those assaults from the other side, which are simply trying to destroy you as a credible witness okay. as they protect people that are hiding behind the Fifth Amendment or out of the country or wherever. And so I thank you for coming here. You deserve a reward for that. Uh, I'm looking at uh, some of the uh, recent developments in the case, and I believe uh, in the meeting, uh, you, Mr. Castro, recalled saying uh, that the October 15th, 1993 meeting at the Department of State where there was a grievance that your family had against a Venezuelan businessman, Thor Halverson. I believe that's correct. Is that is that? correct. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Halverson uh, was hired, I'm told, by the Banco de Venezuela to investigate uh, Castro's. That's correct. What uh, I take it, the feeling is you recall saying that was worth $25,000 after the State Department meeting. Now, did your access to the Department of State mainly come through the donations you gave to the Democratic National Committee? What did you feel on that? I have no idea that uh, I, I confirmed, we're gonna give us $25,000 and you're going to go to the State Department, but I've been involved in politics in the Dominican Republic not directly as a politician, but as a businessman. And I have my personal opinions of many things. Yeah, it doesn't hurt you to have been a donor and a friend of so-and-so. It doesn't. Yeah. Who arranged the appointment for you uh, for that October 15, 1993 meeting with the State Department? And who arranged Charles Intriago. That? Pardon? Mr. Intriago. He was the one who arranged for my grandfather and basically for him to go to the State Department. Now, is he an attorney here in Washington or? Oh, in no, he's an attorney in Florida. In Florida. Yes. So he knew how to get a, an appointment at the State Department. That's correct. Was there any White House involvement in that, to your knowledge? In uh, getting the appointment for you at the State Department? Not to my knowledge. OK. And uh, so it was simply arranged through an attorney in Florida. With whom did you uh, deal in the Department of State? Was it a desk officer for Venezuela? I don't remember his name, but uh, I, I, I was, we were told that, or I was told that he was the representative of South America in the State Department. Okay, maybe the Assistant Secretary was it for Inter-American Affairs? Could be. Uh, what was it that you wanted the State Department to do in your battle for control of the bank uh, with Mr. Halverson, what but were you seeking? Basically, the, my grandfather's goal at that time was to advise the State Department that uh, the embassy in the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela was being used by certain uh, U.S. Uh, employees there to be part of this smear campaign against us. And uh, it was an opportunity for him to explain to a U.S. official what was going on in our side of the of the problem. To your knowledge, did the State Department ever do anything in relation to the allegations you're making about the embassy in Venezuela? Do you know, did they, did, did the attitude change as a result I, of your no, I don't know. Okay. I didn't even ask afterwards. Okay. Uh, now, the question was raised earlier, the degree to which you uh, knew anybody at the Democratic National Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to just uh, Note that in our witness book here, under VEN 26, 
there's a letter from Charles N. Triago, the attorney for his grandfather, uh, to Ronald Brown, Chairman, Democratic National Committee, Dear Ron, just a brief note to tell you that I enjoyed meeting with you during the campaign in Little Rock and Middleburg. Apparently, I'm now a trustee of the DNC, Democratic National Committee, and I'm looking forward to assisting in any way I can. This is dated December 2, 1992. So that you will know a little bit, a uh, little more about me, I enclose a couple of recent issues of my publication, Money Laundering Alert, together with some background information. I think this is an issue on which President Clinton can make some headway in dealing with the drug and white collar crime problems. So I take it. Mr. Intriago, who is a publisher, uh, as well as your father's attorney, uh, is uh, one that was trying to be helpful in tracking drug money. Was that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I think that sounds like an excellent journal we all ought to be subscribing to to see where the money's going in Florida, and I will start looking it up. I'm fascinated by it. Then you've got on uh, exhibit VEN 27, Eric uh, Silden, Director, National Membership services to Dear Charlie. So you have the leader of the Democratic National Committee calls Mr. Intriago, who's taken the fifth, who we hear letters from the lawyer, but he hasn't had the guts to stand in that witness chair Regular order. under oath. The gentleman's time has expired. You're welcome. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize for missing some of the proceedings. So some of what I may be asking may be redundant. But my friend, Mr. Horn, was complimenting you for your your bravery for coming here today. The reason you're here today, though, is you want to get out of jail, isn't it? Well, the reason I'm here today is you want to get out of jail. Correct. There's really no other reason other than that. Okay. You go down deep, that's the reason. Okay. And so I have an understanding of what, what brought you here. And again, I think some of this you've gone over. Did you or your attorneys contact the committee, or did the committee contact you? The committee contacted us. Okay, and what, what did they say? That they, uh, the first time we met? Sure. That they wanted to ask me some questions about the uh, campaign contributions being made by uh, my family. And where were you at the time when you in met? In Manhattan. Manhattan and Detention Center. Okay, so you were in jail when they met you? That's correct. And tell me a little bit more. What, they said they wanted to ask you some questions. What questions did they ask you? The questions about uh, these checks, these, the facts, the facts, the document, this paper, what was going on, the conversation, basically what we've talked of, about here today. And who brought up the possibility of a letter um, that would be written on your behalf? I did. Okay, and what did you say? That the only, the only way I would, I would go forward with any of this is, is if somehow I would be benefited from the situation. And why did you say that? Why did I say that? Because... I mean, if you thought that there was some injustice here, one might think that you would have said, I want to clear up an injustice. I want to get, I want to clear my conscience. I, I'm just curious as to why, why the only reason was <clears throat> you wanted a benefit. As I said before, I mean, I've, the last three years, media-wise, it's, it's been very hard for myself and my family. And basically, the main reason that I didn't want to, I wouldn't have done anything was I don't want no more publicity. I, don't, I, I just want to be left alone and with my life and my family, not all these and, and when cameras you, and When you reporters. said that you wanted a benefit from this, what was the response? That they were going to try. It was never promised to me, and that was basically it. So there was never a promise? There was never a promise to you that it was never a promise. All I was, all I was told was every time we speak to you and if we ever need you and you say the truth, of everything that happened, we'll try to help you. But it was, there was never a, we're going to promise you that on June the 3rd of 1998, you'll be going home, or you'll be put here, or you'll be put there. It was never said to me. Do you think you're going to get a letter? Do I think I'm going to get a letter? I hope so. Do you if think I you're going to get one? Pardon? Do you think you're going to get one? I hope so, yeah. Uh, I didn't, not whether you hope so, do you think so? Yes or no? You think you're going to get a letter, you don't know? I don't, I think I'm going to get it. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm hoping I am. And, and again, what were you, what were you promised though? I wasn't promised anything. Okay. So, so you were never promised a letter? Oh, the, a letter, yes. Okay. I was promised a letter. 
I thought you said you weren't promised anything. Yeah, because I don't, you, you want to go into the, the promise of, if you do this, I promise you that you're going to get out. That's what I was thinking of. Oh, okay. Well, then let's make it very clear. For so me you were promised A letter for me is not promised enough because it's not, it's not a guaranteed thing. Okay, who made the promise to you that you would get a letter? Yeah, the, f the first meeting I had was with Mr. David Cass and some other members of his office in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Who made the promise to you that you'd get a letter? If I, if I told the truth at, at first at the, at the first meeting and second, if I was ever needed, I would get a letter. F uh, Mr. Cass told me the first time, and then Mr. Bennett told me yesterday. That you would get a letter, and what, what did they lead you to believe the letter would say? That I've been cooperated, that I've been truthful, that I've been very helpful, that I should be taking consideration for the work release program, which I am already eligible for, and that was basically it. And the bank that, that closed under, under your leadership, how, how big a bank was that? It was uh, total assets, $50 million, basically. And, and how many depositors lost money? I don't have the exact number. I don't, I'm sure you don't have the exact number, but I'm sure you have a ballpark figure as to how many depositors lost money. I believe they're getting their money back, so I don't know if the losing money is, is appropriate, but I would say that at the time of the, of the trial, before anything was, any money was given back to them by the Venezuelan authorities, 30, 35 people, 40, 50 at roughly. And how many employees lost their jobs? Five. I think my time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. I'm going to yield one of uh, Mr. Bennett's 10 minutes so that he can explain the letter. I think it's a bone of contention. I think you have a right to know, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Congressman, Congressman Barrett, uh, for the record, uh, yesterday, uh, David Sadkin and Michael Yang of Minority Staff and I and David Cass of Majority Staff, as well as Major Gil Macklin and Butch Hodgson, the retired FBI agent who's the chief investigator, uh, representatives of both the majority and minority met with Mr. Castro uh, and with his attorney. And there was no great secret about this. We indicated that the chairman would write a letter at some point in time upon request noting cooperation with a copy to Congressman Waxman. That's, that's the extent of the conversation. That's basically correct, isn't it, Mr. Castro? That's correct. And so the record is clear. Congressman Burton was to write a letter upon the request with a copy to Congressman Waxman and Minority Council were aware of it yesterday. There's no great secret about it. And any letter to be written that was understood would be copied to Congressman Waxman, which might explain some of the confusion by Mr. Castro believing that a member of the Democratic side of the aisle would actually sign the letter. The representation in the presence of Minority Council was Congressman Burton would at some point in time send the letter upon request when it was deemed to be appropriate by Mr. Castro's lawyer, and Congressman Waxman would be copied with that letter. I have nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. Mr. Mike is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, can I add something briefly? Mr. Chairman, uh, the witness had asked if he could uh, respond. Yes, you can respond on my time, sir. I'm recognized. Just to just, uh, make it clear to the question I was asked before about... If well, the well, go ahead, proceed. I was asked if, if anybody from the Democratic side had promised me anything. I was asked that before. and. That's exactly what I was told yesterday, what Mr. Bennett just said, I, that a copy would be given back and forth. That's what I understood, that it was going to be signed. I didn't know it was a copy, or that's what I understood, just understood. to make it clear. Mr. Micah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to question the witness at this time. However, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make a, a, a brief uh, statement. I think uh, today's hearing uh, shows another example of how uh, the other side of the aisle is doing everything possible to cover up, uh, stall, impede, smear, besmirch uh, witnesses that we have here, uh, this investigation. Uh, quite frankly, I'm very frustrated in this process. Uh, last week, uh, I sat here as I saw them for the first time invoke not granting uh, uh, immunity to witnesses that had been recommended by the Department of Justice. Uh, today, I'm totally dismayed with the New York Times uh, uh, editorial and uh, revelation that, in fact, the Attorney General who came before this panel and sat in those chairs uh, 
has now announced that Mr. Labella, who sh she put in charge of the investigation at the Department of, D of Justice, this whole fiasco, uh, fending off the appointment of an independent counsel recommended by the director of the FBI, even in his testimony before us, both in closed and open sessions. Uh, and today we find Mr. Labella is being uh, uh, shipped off to uh, San Diego. Uh, they are making a farce in this uh, hearing. Uh, they are making a farce in the Department of Justice. Uh, they are uh, destroying the process that maintains the integrity of a check and balance system in this nation. I am just personally offended by this. And uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that today's New York Times editorial be made a part of this record, and I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Uh, Horn in, in great disgust. Without objection. I thank the gentleman very much uh, for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I simply want to put some things in that are in our briefing book. Uh, one, there's an article in the uh, Miami Herald uh, that uh, was written by David Lyons uh, on the situation of Mr. Halverson and the Castro family. And I just like that uh, inserted at this point. Uh, number two, I, be objection. I believe the letter from the lawyer has been put in of Mr. Entriago. Is that correct? Uh, because uh, that is correct. All right. Uh, you will note in that letter, he says, uh, as lawyers often do, uh, Mr. Intriago is not a government official. We know that. He's never held a high elected or appointed government position. He has never been an employee of or consultant to the Democratic National Committee, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the point is, I read the letter to Ron Brown. Uh, I assume that will be put in at this point in the Without exhibit. Objection. It's in our exhibit book. And I'd like put in also the next exhibit, which I guess you just got, VEN 29, is to our chief counsel, Mr. Bennett's from Acting Assistant Attorney General Richard. And he makes the point in the first paragraph, I'm writing in response to your letter of April 7th, 1998, requesting the Department of Justice's position on the granting of immunity to Charles Intriago, Yoshi Gandhi, uh, Ahmed Abdullah Shafi, Jeffrey Niemeyer, Simon Chen, and Sion Fi Man. The department opposes immunity in each of these cases. In other words, even if you tried to get Mr. Intriago here, who's taken the fifth, has his lawyer writing this letter, which is a little disingenuous to say, be charitable about it, uh, since he was a good friend of Ron Brown on a first name basis, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. There are other letters in here uh, from officials of the Democratic National Committee. So he was tied in with that. Now, uh, Justice says, hey, we don't want you to offer any immunity to him. I wonder why is all I ask the question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Micah, I want General. to yield back the time to you if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a point of order. Was my uh, request uh, granted for yes, unanimous yes, consent? Was. Thank you. I yield yes. back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Kostanich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would, uh, I'll yield my time to Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. I, I don't have any questions right now for Mr. Castro, but since the argument du jour seems to be the uh, hearing last week pertaining to the immunization uh, of the witnesses, I just want to take a minute to, to comment on that from a, a perspective of someone who did not vote to immunize those witnesses, a vote that was um, clearly, for me, an easy vote. There are some times when you vote in Congress and it's a difficult vote. You don't know whether you're doing the right thing. You don't know whether you're doing the wrong thing. Um, I felt then and I feel now that I was doing the right thing. And I, I think it's important for, for people to understand why I'm so comfortable with that vote. I think it's important that we do have an investigation of allegations of wrongdoing. I think it's important that that investigation be a fair investigation. I think that allegations uh, that are levied against both Democrats and Republicans should be investigated. Um, I am convinced, however, that this committee has absolutely no intent in the world 
to have a fair investigation. As Mr. Waxman indicated last fall, committee Democrats voted, I believe unanimously, to immunize three witnesses at that time. We did so notwithstanding our reservations about the fairness of this investigation. But the events that have transpired since then have led me to the conclusion that this committee has absolutely no credibility. And I just want to take a minute to explain why. I think all of us have heard the comments that the chairman made. I do not feel comfortable repeating those comments that he made about the president in public. My colleague, Mrs. Maloney, last week said that if her kids had used that, that phrase, their mouth would have been washed out with soap. I think if I were a child and I had used those comments, my mother would have washed my mouth out with soap. Um, and I just am, am boggled how we can go forward with an investigation when the chairman has made it so crystal clear that his number one goal is to get the president. When we walked into that hearing, this hearing last week, I saw the wall. It reminded me a lot of a uh, homecoming float um, that I worked on when I was a freshman in high school. And sadly, I think that it also is about equivalent to the maturity level of high school freshmen. This is a serious matter. And, and there's not a person in this Capitol who's going to walk into this room and look at that and say, well, this is just a farce. There's no attempt here to, to even have a semblance of professionalism. Uh, and to me, it's just, it's a, it's, an, it's a great device to show how unfair this investigation is. I would note that the committee, there's no picture of the committee on that wall. Maybe that's because this committee's off the wall uh, in terms of the seriousness with which we are examining these, these, these allegations. So when someone comes to me and says, why didn't you vote to immunize those witnesses? I tell them, because there's no, there's no attempt to find truth here. This is simply an attempt to try to throw as much mud at the President of the United States as possible. Now, that doesn't even go into the merits of the immunity. And Mr. Kanjorski was asking whether there had been proffers of, of testimony. Maybe some people prior to this year didn't know what a proffer was, but we all know from, from the, uh, the Starr investigation of Ms. Lewin Lewinsky um, what a proffer is. And there really hasn't been any proffers, as, at least as far as I can tell. And the immunity that we granted last fall, one of the witnesses that appeared obviously should not have received immunity. Granting immunity is not something where you're, you're voting to pass a bill or not pass a bill or to designate a stamp for something. You're telling someone, legally, you're off the hook. For whatever you say, whatever you've done, you're off the hook. I don't take that lightly. That, to me, is not a vote on, on a bill. That, to me, is whether someone who has committed injustice against our society should be allowed to walk. And I don't think that this committee has shown the credibility, the maturity, or the integrity to grant those types of motions. And for that reason, it was a very comfortable vote. I'll do it again when it comes up next week. And I think that if, if this Congress is serious about having a professional investigation, it's got to be done somewhere else, because this committee has shown time and time again it's unable to do so. And that is why you've had professionals from that side of the aisle, Republicans, good Republicans, who have left, who have left the staff. They can't take it. Um, you have to have integrity. And, and I don't think that this committee has it. And, and for that reason, again, um, I'm very, very comfortable with my actions. And I yield back to Mr. Kucinich. Yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Snowbarger. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield time to uh, Representative Horn. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Castro, in the uh, examination by our general counsel, Mr. Bennett, you reviewed and said yes to uh, uh, which uh, donations were made and uh, how you had been asked by Mr. Intriago, so forth, and that your Aunt Maria Castro contributed $20,000 to the DNC Victory Fund. Now, what I want to get to, after all that has been admitted, it, did anyone from the United States Department of Justice, such as, say, the uh, U.S. Attorney, perhaps in the, the Southern District of Florida, contact you regarding any of these contributions that were made by you or your aunt? 
Did any of them ever come to interview you or ask any questions about it? I had a meeting in the district attorney's office before this, the members of this committee spoke with me. I think they were from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Florida and New York. Uh, so you were interviewed, and uh, what interests me is eventually it was determined that there was no further role for you to play in the investigation. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, do you remember who at Justice contacted you? No, I don't remember. There's a letter written. It was, uh, there was a letter written to the sentencing judge by that person. All right. If that's available, Mr. Chairman, I'd like that put in the uh, record at this point. Without objection. Uh, what was the nature of your discussion with the justice officials? Was it generally what you've told this it's committee? It's exactly the same thing. Okay. Uh, did anyone from the Department of Justice inquire why you specifically contributed to the Florida Democratic Party and why your aunt, a resident of the state of Florida, contributed to the Maryland Victory Fund? They asked me the same questions, yes. They did ask you that? Yes. Very good. You were initially directed by Charles Intriago to make your $5,000 donation to the Ohio Democratic Party, not the Florida Democratic Party, were you not? The first check was made to the Ohio Party, correct. Right. Uh, and that's, uh, Mr. Chairman, is VEN2, and if we might have that in the record at this point. Without objection. When you inquired as to why you were directed to make the contribution in that matter, uh, Mr. Intriago stated, quote, that's the way they want it, unquote. Is that correct? That's correct. Did anyone from the Department of Justice ask you for any documents regarding the political contributions either you or your aunt made? Uh, I think they already had it at that time because the district attorney's office had given them copies of basically the same copies we have in front of us. When you use the word district attorney, are you talking about Mr. Morgenthau's office Mr. in Morgenthau's New York? Office. That's correct. Mr. Morgenthau's, Morgenthau's office in New York. So they had the Xeroxes of your checks uh, that uh, showed these various contributions that we have in our witness exhibit book and that have been put on the screen. That's correct. Okay. Uh, have you been contacted this year from anyone from the Department of Justice? No, I have not. Well, uh, it's uh, fascinating to me that in a way this is such an open and shut case of where conduits were used, uh, who were U.S. citizens, to take foreign money and put it into American political campaigns. And obviously, Mr. Intriago knows exactly what he was doing. He was in the business of publishing a paper about laundering money. So when he was laundering money, it's sort of ironic that with all that evidence, the Department of Justice simply sat by idly and didn't do anything. Is that uh, your sort of uh, reaction to the situation, why they didn't do something? I know I'm sure you're glad they didn't, but... Uh, um. You know, why, I, I'm curious as, as an I, as oversight I, committee, why didn't they? As I told uh, Mr., I think it was Mr., one of these gentlemen over here, I, I never asked myself why they, did they go after Charles Intriago, did this or did that, because that was not, basically it wasn't my, my main concern. Yeah. Frankly, I don't want anyone to go to jail yeah. and gone through what I've gone through, so I wouldn't. Well, I, I appreciate your testimony. As I said earlier, it's nice to have someone here that uh, looks us in the eye and uh, says yes, no, or this or that, and gives us a reasonable explanation Thank and you. doesn't just dance around it, even though you've had a lot of people that seem to be working for the defense counsel uh, rather than doing a congressional duty. So it amazes me on some of the questions you've been asked today. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, sir. I yield to Mr. Micah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request, uh, and uh, I'll just uh, outline it here. Uh, I think the other side had indicated uh, that Mr. Charles Interaga was not a government employee, and I, I do have a, a background uh, on him. I'd like made part of the record that indicates, in fact, that uh, he uh, went to work for con former Congressman Danny Fassell as a staff member of the Government Operations Committee, the predecessor to this committee, and also uh, worked uh, in 
private practice until hired as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida in 1975 and additional information relating to his background. I'd like that uh, submitted to the record, if I may. Reserving the right to object, could you just clarify the years in which Mr. Entriago worked for Mr. Fassell or worked at the U.S. Uh, Attorney's yes, Office? Yes, I'd be glad to. Uh, Excuse me, could we get a copy of that too, please? Be glad to give the minority a copy of that. I think it's in your folder. The gentleman was going to tell uh, us the Oh, you, do you want the, the dates? Yes, please. Uh, from the South Florida Business Journal, 1225-89, uh, Mr. Interago worked for the Government Ops Committee from 1968 to 1973. These weren't during the time when this contribution was made. Right. Pardon? That was much earlier than this contribution. Uh, this is a, a matter of fact. I'm just stating it for the record, the period of time that he was a government employee. I have no objection to this going into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barr? Mr. Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Castro, uh, you're not a lawyer, are you? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Entriago is a lawyer, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the district attorney for uh, Manhattan is a lawyer, is that correct? That's correct. Too? You mentioned that uh, you had been approached uh, at some point by some people from the Department of Justice. Did they ever talked with you? Yes. Were they lawyers? Some were lawyers, some were investigators, and some were member, I think, of the FBI or something. Okay. There are some provisions of the United States Code found in Title II, which relates to federal campaign laws, uh, which uh, make it uh, unlawful for uh, foreign nationals to directly or indirectly contribute to U.S. campaigns or to make donations in the names of other persons. Uh, there's a separate section that pertains to contributions generally made in the name of another person, whether they're foreign money or, or uh, U.S. Uh, money. Uh, would, would it be your impression that probably uh, people that are lawyers, including Mr. Entriago, would be familiar with those, with those laws? It would be my impression, yes. Uh, mine, too. Uh, and one would presume also that the attorneys from the Department of Justice that spoke with you would be familiar with those laws, too. When, when did that discussion or those discussions take place? I would say October, November of 97. Okay. Uh, would that be after the uh, statute of limitations had run? I have no idea when the statute of limitations September. Would. It's September of 97. September? Oh. I'm not asking you for, for professional yeah, I, knowledge of, of I that. remember my other attorney, Mr. Nurek, which is not present, he told me that uh, the statute of limitation was about to, to expire. So I spoke with uh, these people before. The statute, whenever the date was, it was before, presumably the statute of limitation would have been. Did, did, uh, did these folks that talked with you from the Department of Justice seem to be interested in uh, evidence of foreign money uh, coming into the U.S. Uh, election campaigns? By the questions that they were, I, I was asked, that they were basically the same questions I was asked when, in, by members of this committee before. It's basically the same thing. But uh, nothing has happened since then at all? Uh, no. Uh, although Mr. Entriago is not interested in appearing here, he like so many people in all of these matters, uh, is very interested in having their attorneys make statements. Uh, and of course, the attorneys cannot be held directly accountable. So it's fairly easy. Uh, for example, uh, a reporter in Miami, Ms. Uh, Gail Epstein, uh, reported in a, an article in the Miami Herald of February 28th of this year uh, that uh, one of Mr. Intriago's attorneys uh, said that, quote, he will at the appropriate time and place tell his side of the story, close quote. I mean, that's something that we hear a lot from people in this administration and witnesses that the appropriate time and the place they'll tell their story. Uh, and in the meantime, they send uh, self-serving letters like the one that was introduced this morning. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, this, this whole process that brings us here today was not started by this committee, was it? I mean, this arose out of 
the investigation from the district attorney's office in, in Manhattan. That's correct. Uh, so one would think that if, if Mr. Intriago's army of attorneys uh, had a problem, uh, as he seems to indicate in this gratuitous statement, uh, that he really should have a problem with the district attorney's office in Manhattan. Wouldn't would that be fair? That would be fair to say. Uh, yet I don't think he's written uh, the silliness uh, to them, uh, his attorneys, that is. He apparently hasn't done anything. Uh, I know there was a discussion between you and, and one of the folks on the other side uh, as part of their continuing effort to trivialize anything connected with this uh, uh, investigation. But uh, it's not your testimony here today that the matters that we're looking into are, are trivial, is it? I mean, do you agree that these are very serious matters? I agree. I agree they are very serious matters after everything I've read in the media in the last year, year and a half, two years. Uh, is, would you agree with me that one reason they are serious is because uh, foreign money coming in, as, as you have testified, uh, seems to be the case, and as the district attorney's office in Manhattan suspected uh, is the case, uh, really go to the heart of the political system here in this country, of which all citizens uh, should be concerned with. Uh, do you agree that that is very serious? Yes. Thank you. Uh, one wishes that our colleagues on the other side uh, shared, uh, shared that, that viewpoint, because we do believe that it is, and that's, that's why you're here today. Mm -hmm. uh, not to be congratulated, but simply to answer, answer questions, and for that we do appreciate your being here. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to ask everybody here to take a step back and put this hearing and your testimony into perspective. This committee is supposed to be investigating campaign finance abuses in 1996, where the chairman alleged that there was a massive effort for foreign money to be funneled into the United States to corrupt our political system, primarily by the Chinese government. And uh, that, that has been the stated objective of our investigation. What we have here today from Mr. Castro is a statement that he contributed in 1992 money at the request of uh, an attorney who had worked for his grandfather uh, to the Democratic Party. A as far as anybody in the Democratic Party would have known, Mr. Castro was a man who seemed to be well off financially. He was sending in checks the way any citizen could do. He was a U.S. citizen. There's no way in the world they would know uh, that the contribution might have been reimbursed. On the face of it, here's a contribution from a man who's a U.S. citizen. He's well off. He's sending it uh, to the Democratic Party. So uh, that, that, that's, that seems to me the facts. Uh, those are the facts, and, I, and it's hard to know what, what to make of it, except if there was a conduit contribution, and that is against the law. So there was a conduit contribution. With conduit contribution means that the contributor really didn't contribute the money. Someone else paid for it. Well, the contributor didn't know, couldn't, wouldn't on the surface appear to know about it. There's no evidence anybody's offered that the Democratic Party or President Clinton would have known about this contribution having been reimbursed. On the face of it, they would have looked at it as a proper one. So uh, what we then have is Mr. Castro's statement years later that this contribution had been reimbursed and he told that to, to law enforcement officials. So the question is, why, why wasn't there a prosecution by the Justice Department? And uh, that seems to me, I guess, the question for this hearing. Did the Justice Department act appropriately or inappropriately? The next witnesses we're going to hear from are, are, were at the, U, uh, uh, the prosecutors in New York, and they turned over the information they had. And the Justice Department uh, hasn't acted. Now, it's not unusual for the Justice Department to, uh, not to act right away. Even with Charlie Tree, they had, uh, they had information about Charlie Tree in 1996, and they didn't indict him until 1998, 15 months after the allegation surfaced. Now, this is many years later. The Justice Department, probably, uh, you can conjecture about it. Maybe they're trying to evaluate whether they've got a good case. The evidence to indicate that it, it was a conduit contribution is Mr. Castro's statement. Uh, 
Mr. Intriago presumably would deny it. So you have his word against Mr. Intriago. The other evidence is a fax from Mr. Intriago to Mr. Castro saying, send checks. Here's, to make, who's to make them, here's how you should make them out. Send checks. And he did it. So it, it's not, uh, it seems to me, a, a, a case that's easy to prove. But the, the thing that's puzzling to me, Mr. Chairman, is why isn't the Justice Department here today? Why haven't they been asked to come in and explain their actions? Uh, if that's what this hearing's all about, if this hearing's no, no longer about a massive funneling of Chinese contributions into the U.S. political system, it's about one contribution that uh, may well have been a conduit contribution, and if the issue is really whether the Justice Department didn't prosecute when they should have, shouldn't we have the Justice Department here, and have they been invited? And I yield to you. To uh, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Waxman, I intend to have the Justice Department here at the conclusion of this hearing. We just didn't want to take too much time today, but I'm glad you suggested it because we're going to do it. Well, it just seems to me that not that complicated an issue. Uh, they could have been permitted to testify at this hearing, and we could hear what they have to say. Uh, it, it would be appropriate to hear from them, and then we'll, then we'll know whether they... Uh, but I guess the implication of all this is you're accusing the Justice Department of acting improperly. But I've seen no evidence of that. And they haven't been given a chance to, to come in and uh, be questioned about it. So, I, Mr. Castro, I, I appreciate your being here. I can understand why you're here. I have no criticism of your being here. Your, 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 uh, your statements uh, about why you're here is that you, you hope to get some benefit out of it uh, because you're being cooperative. And I appreciate the fact that you are here. and. Uh, uh, giving us this testimony. But it just seems to me that this is a very odd hearing to be held uh, when the whole investigation had been trumpeted as, a, as one going after uh, the President of the United States, the Democratic Party, et cetera. Mr. Barr made the statement, it's uh, not unusual for people in the administration not to do this or that. M Mr. Intriago was never part of this administration, and I don't think anybody ought to be misled by that fact. He may or may not have broken the law. There are a lot of other people who may or may not have, and they should be prosecuted if there's enough of a case to uh, win. Gentlemen's time has expired. Before I yield to Mr. Cox, I'd like to take uh, five minutes of my own. Uh, Mr. Waxman well knows uh, that we, when we started these and our protocol and our discussions, that our hearings were going to involve campaign contributions, illegal campaign contributions, all the way back to 1992. The committee's investigation and subject areas have always included the 1992 campaign, and our deposition authority specifically, specifically discusses the 1992 campaign. Key figures such as John Wong, the Riottis, Maria Shaw, and others began their donations in 1992. So this is all baloney. Now, in addition to that, let me just say that there's a pattern here that started back in 1992. This is just one manifestation, in my opinion, of funneling illegal foreign cam campaign contributions into this country. We know the DNC has returned millions of dollars and, and probably will return more. We know that Charlie Tree, who's been indicted, brought 700 and some thousand dollars in illegal contributions into the President's Legal Defense Fund. So this is, this is just baloney that this is all something that we shouldn't even be talking about. We know that foreign contributions were funneled into this country. And what we're establishing here today is it started in 1992. We don't know how pervasive it was, but we know it even came from South America, from Southeast Asia, from all over the world, any place they could get a buck. And we've got 92 people that have either taken the fifth or fled the country, and some, a few, have been immunized and testified. So, you know, when they poo-poo this investigation, it, it bothers me a great deal. Now, you did say one thing, Mr. Waxman, that, that rings a bell with me and rings true or, and, and, and is of great concern to me. Did the Justice Department do its job? Were they just incompetent? Or did they deliberately not pursue Mr. Intriago? They knew in the fall of 1996 that money laundering had taken place. It was referred to them in the, in the Southern District of Florida uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. In May, it was then sent to the Public Integrity Section before the statute of limitations had run out, and yet they didn't do anything. It was tied up with a bow around it and give it to them, and they didn't do a thing. They didn't even talk to Mr. Entriago, and he was a friend of Mr. Gore, the Vice President. Now, why is that? 
you got to say it raises a few of your antenna. A few antenna. Well, the gentleman now, yield. just a, five, a minute. I, I'm not going to yield to you. Well, I yield now, you to keep, you. you keep talking about how we have been just focusing uh, on, on all, the all the Democrats and leaving them. 80%, 80% of our subpoenas have gone to six people. One of those is Ted Siong, who gave money to both the Democrats and the Republicans. We've also looked into the Young Brothers. We're looking into other things regarding Republicans. The problem is the vast part of the investigation is focused on Democrats because that's where the biggest part of the problem is. That's where the money was coming in, millions of dollars millions of dollars. We don't know how many millions, but we do know the Democrat National Committee has returned a large amount of that money. We do know Charlie Tree's been indicted. We do know that John Wong brought illegal contributions in, we believe from Indonesia. We do know that Webb Hubble got $700,000 for what we know not. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be looked into. And we are going to bring the Justice Department before this committee and ask them why why they didn't pursue this case involving Mr. Entriago. They didn't need to make this a public thing. They could have had the FBI just go talk to Mr. Mr. Entriago and said, well, you know, what, did, were you aware that Mr. Castro was bringing this money in? Did you ask him to do it? But they chose not to do it. And the thing that bothers me today, and Mr. Mike has put this in the record, is when we asked Janet Reno to appoint an independent counsel, and Louis Free said we should have, the FBI director, she said no, and they were going to clean up this mess, and she brought in Mr. LaBella to head the investigation. Now that everything's cooled off, they're sending Mr. LaBella back to California. They're going to make him a U.S. attorney out there. I guess that's the, the carrot they're using to get him out of here. And this investigation by the FBI or by the Justice Department is just going to go right straight down the tubes, and they're going to cover up for this administration again. Janet Reno, in my opinion, has been like Horatius Horatius at the bridge, protecting the administration. And I think that if you, anybody who clearly looks at this would have to question whether or not that statement I just made is valid. And we intend to keep pursuing this, and we're going to bring justice over here and ask them to explain that. And with that, uh, I yield back my time and yield to Mr. Cox. Mr. Chairman, would you give me a chance to say a word on this? Mr. Cox has the time. How much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? I thank you, and I'd like to thank our witness for uh, staying with us for the better part of the day. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Castro, um, to refer to Exhibit VEN3, which is the memo that uh, you got from Intriago that tells you precisely how to make out checks to the DNC Victory Fund Federal Account, to the Ohio Victory Fund Federal Account, to the Maryland Victory Fund Federal Account, and so on. This is all in Triago's handwriting, is that right? Could have been his or his secretary, I'm not quite sure. But there's sure. no question that he sent you the memo and he gave you these directions. That's correct. Now, at the time that you were writing these checks in response to his instructions, was it your understanding that you would be reimbursed that's correct. And why did you think that? Why did you think you'd be reimbursed? What gave you that idea? Because if not, I, would have, I wouldn't have given the money out. Uh, and did, uh, did your understanding arise from conversations with Intriago? That's correct. So he made it clear to you that you would be reimbursed? That's correct. And um, did he give you any indication from whom the reimbursement would come? It was going to come from uh, one of my family's group uh, companies in Venezuela. So it would be f overseas money? That's correct. Now, when you made all of this information available to uh, the DA in New York, uh, what did he do with it? I didn't make it available to them. It was part of their investigation. They made it available to us. I see. Uh, did you uh, end up having your bank account information turned over to the DA? They had it all. They had it all. The so they had bank account information. They had banking records. Since I was nine years old, and every bank account I've ever owned. Okay, and that included uh, 
all of the bank records that would be necessary to corroborate all this check writing, right? That's correct. Uh, and uh, according to the documents that we have here, uh, at your sentencing, uh, the judge of the New York Supreme Court said, uh, it appears as if a corroborated prosecution of political contributions that were illegal was provided to the United States Department of Justice and there's nothing to show for it. Is it your understanding that Judge McLaughlin felt that he saw evidence of a crime? From what yes, he said? that's correct. And so we have all of this information provided by the DA in New York who apparently believes there's evidence of a crime. Uh, the judge of the New York Supreme Court thinks there's evidence of a crime. Uh, and uh, all of this is turned over to the United States Department of Justice in what year? Oh, 97, 1997. 1997. So this is an old stuff, as the ranking member was indicating. This is 1997, after the 96 elections, when all of this stuff had hit the fan publicly uh, about illegal campaign contributions. Is that right? That's correct. So in this context, the Department of Justice writes a letter that says, quote, there is at this time no further role for you to play with this evidence that you provided in matters under investigation by the task force. And that's the task force that's investigating illegal campaign contributions. Why do you think that happened? I have no idea. Just, I just know that the letter was received by the judge and was shown to me. Uh, now, you're aware that there was a statute of limitations that was going to run on these crimes? Yes. And what, what year was that statute going to run? I think it was told by my other attorney that it was at the end of October of 1997, November of 1997. So if the Department of Justice did nothing throughout 1997, their ability to prosecute, say, Mr. Intriago, would disappear, right? According to the statute of limitations, yes. Because the statute of limitations would run. Now, this committee sought from the Department of Justice uh, uh, their cooperation in our putting questions to Mr. Intriago. And we got a letter back just a few days ago that says they oppose this. They oppose granting immunity even though the statute of limitations ran in 1997 and even though they didn't lift a finger when all this information was provided to them. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I think it's remarkable that we can have this kind of documentary evidence that a crime has been committed, that we can have uh, the DA in New York uh, serve this stuff up on a silver platter, that we can have the judge of the New York Supreme Court tell us, quote, it appears as if a, as if a corroborated prosecution of political contributions that were illegal was provided to the United States Department of Justice and there's nothing to show for it. Uh, and uh, on top of that, then, to have the Department of Justice, uh, after the expiration of the statute of limitations, after their opportunity to prosecute uh, has lapsed, uh, oppose uh, our questioning this witness, uh, I think is uh, absolutely remarkable. And so uh, for obviously different reasons, I agree completely with our ranking member that we ought to be able to put these questions directly to the Department of Justice. And I, I thank you for uh, the opportunity to cover these matters, which bear directly on what has happened since 1996 at this Department of Justice. Let me ask you one final question. Uh, the, the fellow up there uh, uh, with Mr. Clinton in that picture, uh, is that your grandfather? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and your grandfather was a big contributor uh, to the Democratic Party and to Mr. Clinton? Is that right? If these amounts are considered big for U.S. standards. Uh, and so, at a time when uh, these big contributions are being made to the President of the United States, the President's own cabinet is responsible for investigating uh, the crimes that have been served up by the DA of uh, Manhattan uh, and that, uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of New York uh, finds uh, have not been uh, pursued. Uh, I think it's, uh, it speaks for itself. And uh, you're quite right to include this in our investigation of what's going on in this campaign investigation in the Clinton administration. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Castro, you and your attorney want to thank you for your participation. Uh, you are excused and will now bring uh, our next panel forward. Uh, uh, before we leave, the marshals have indicated that it might be helpful if you were to indicate that the writ was satisfied and he's free to be taken back. Uh, Chairman. 
Uh, could I uh, make one suggestion? Mr. If there's Horn. Any, if there's any intimidation of you for your appearance before this committee, I hope you'll immediately let the chairman know. It's okay. Uh, I was former vice chairman of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and there was a statute we relied on that if any witnesses were intimidated, that is a federal offense. And the United States attorneys, if they're awake, uh, would uh, be indicting the people that did the intimidation. Thank you very much, Thank sir. You, Mr. Mr. Yes, sir. Chairman, uh, before he leaves, just to, for the record, can I ask one question? Th th there was a statement made that someone attempted to stab you in prison. Is that an accurate statement? To stab me in prison? Yes. That's incorrect. Because the chairman made that statement, I, and I didn't know whether... No, no, no. I never made any statement like that. No, no. I was never... I've never made a statement like that. Not that I know that. of. <laughs> Uh, on the Larry King live show, which I didn't see. No, but no, no. You, you're, you're getting secondhand information. I never made a statement like that. The gentleman is uh, is uh, excused, and uh, he's uh, remanded to the custody of the marshals for return. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, as I've been informed, the statement that you made was that you were going to get this gentleman to a safe place so he wouldn't get stabbed. What I said was that I wanted to, uh, we wanted to make sure, and he wanted to make sure, and I think everybody wanted to make sure, that he was going to be safe in a safe place in a different facility before he came to testify because there was some concerns about his safety. Yes. But I didn't say he had been stabbed. Thank you. And we are always concerned about the safety of our witnesses. We are now going to have uh, Richard T. Priest, is it? Price, Price excuse me and Joseph J. Dawson uh, uh, to testify for us. Would you both uh, stand and raise your right hand, please? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Thank you. Be seated. I understand that you both have opening statements. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dawson's going to start, if that's all right with you. Mr. Dawson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Joseph J. Dawson. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm an assistant district attorney in the office of Robert M. Morgenthau, the district attorney of the County of New York. I have been employed in the New York County District Attorney's Office since September 1987. My colleague, Assistant District Attorney Richard T. Price, and I are here pursuant to subpoenas that have been served upon us. We've been asked to make brief statements outlining certain evidence of political corrupt, uh, pol I'm sorry, political contributions that we obtained in the course of a bank fraud investigation and our contacts with the United States Department of Justice with respect to that evidence. We've attempted to coordinate our statements to avoid repetition. In May 1995, I was assigned to an investigation of certain Venezuelan banking groups that had conducted business through New York banks and had collapsed in December 1994. The investigation later focused on transactions conducted by Banco Progreso in Venezuela, Banco Progreso Internacional de Puerto Rico, BPIPR, and Banco Latino Americano in the Dominican Republic. These three banks, our investigation showed, were owned by Orlando Castro Yanis, a Venezuelan citizen who moved to Miami, Florida after the collapse of his banks. Castro Yanis's son, Orlando Castro Castro, was the president of Banco Progreso in Venezuela. Jorge Castro, Castro Yanis's grandson and Castro Castro's nephew, was president of Banco Latino Americano in the Dominican Republic. Until April 1994, he was also the president of BPIPR, which was closed by Puerto Rican banking regulators in January 1995. In or about February, mid-February 1996, authorities in the Dominican Republic granted me, an analyst, and several investigators from our office access to the premises and files of Banco Latino Americano in Santo Domingo. The Dominican banking superintendent had closed the bank at the end of December 1994. Among the items found in the office of Jorge Castro's secretary was a copy of a fax dated September 16, 1992 from C. Intriago to Jorge Castro, which appeared to contain instructions for payments to be made by Jorge Castro and someone named Maria to the DNC Victory Fund 92 federal account and to two state victory funds. The amounts listed in the fax were 20 for the DNC Victory Fund from both Jorge and Maria, and five from each for a state victory fund, a different state fund in each case. We also found copies of three checks corresponding to the instructions in the fax. 
A $20,000 check dated September 15, 1992, payable to the DNC Victory Fund 92 federal account, drawn on Jorge Castro's account at a Florida bank and apparently signed by him. A second $20,000 check dated September 16, 1992, payable to the DNC Victory Fund 92 federal account, drawn on the account of Maria Cire Castro at a Florida bank and apparently signed by her and a third check in the amount of $5,000 written by Jorge Castro to the Ohio Victory Fund 92 federal account as directed in the facts. There was also a copy of a $5,000 check written by Jorge Castro to a state fund that was not listed in the facts. Records of Jorge and Maria Cire Castro's bank accounts, which we later subpoenaed, showed that the two $20,000 checks to the DNC Victory Fund 92 were cashed in November 1992. None of the other checks found in Santo Domingo had been cashed. However, we later obtained records revealing that a $5,000 check written by Jorge Castro in October 1992 to the Florida Democratic Party had also been cashed. Although we found evidence showing a $5,000 debit for a check paid from Maria Cire Castro's account at around the same time, we did not obtain a copy of that check. Other bank records that we subpoenaed suggested that both Jorge Castro and Maria Cire Castro had been reimbursed for these payments by a Venezuelan company controlled by Orlando Castroianis. The records showed that on September 24, 1992, just eight days after the date on the facts, $24,990 was credited to the account of Jorge Castro and a like amount to the account of Maria Cire Castro. These payments, $25,000 each, less a $10 wire transfer fee, had been made at the instructions of an entity called Inversiones Latin Fiend um, through the New York, account of Bank, New York account of Banco Latino, a Venezuelan bank, into the personal accounts of Jorge and Maria Cire Castro. According to documents we obtained from officials of the Venezuelan government, the entity that initiated the transfers, Inversiones Latin Fiend, was controlled by Jorge Castro's grandfather, Castro Yanis. On, October, on April 3, 1996, a New York County grand jury filed an indictment against Orlando Castro Yanis, Orlando Castro Castro, and Jorge Castro concerning their conduct with respect to BPIPR, the bank in Puerto Rico. All three defendants were charged with scheme to defraud in the first degree. Castro Castro was also charged with grand larceny in the first degree because of a $10 million transfer made from the Puerto Rican bank to the parent bank in Venezuela. Jorge Castro was also charged with grand larceny in the first and second degrees. The first degree larceny charge arose from his use of $3.26 million of the Puerto Rican bank's money to prop up the Dominican bank. And the second degree larceny charge arose from his use of more than $350,000 of the Puerto Rican bank's money to buy himself a boat. On May 16 and 17, 1996, Castro Yanis, Castro Castro, and Jorge Castro were arraigned in New York on the indictment after they had been extradited from Florida. They were ordered held without bail pending trial. From that point forward, the Castro bank fraud and grand larceny case became an intensely litigated matter. We continue to investigate the matter of the payments by the Castros even as we litigated the pretrial matters in the Castro case. However, since the payments involved potential violations of federal law, our office decided in very early October 1996 that this would be a matter that we should refer to federal prosecutors in Miami. Accordingly, on or about October 9, 1996, another ADA from our office wrote to an assistant United States attorney in Miami and transmitted with the letter various documents concerning several matters, including the questionable political contributions to the office of the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. I am told that our assistant met with the Miami AUSA concerning these matters on or about October 17, 1996, and forwarded additional material to him on or about October 29, 1996. At that point, we were actively preparing for the Castro trial, and virtually all of our attention was directed to that effort. The Castro trial began on November 12, 1996. It concluded on February 19, 1997, with a jury verdict convicting all three defendants. Several days later, our office sent more documents to the Miami U.S. Attorney's Office. On March 11, 1997, I discussed the matter of the political contributions with the AUSA from the Southern District of Florida. He told me that the Florida office would focus upon the campaign contributions and that the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York would focus on other matters relating to the Castros. During that telephone conversation, we discussed several issues. 
including a potential statute of limitations problem, since the fax from Cien Triago to Jorge Castro had been sent and the checks from the Castros written in the fall of 1992. On March 20, 1997, Jorge Castro agreed to be debriefed by personnel from our office, and he met with us on April 3, 1997 as well. In the March 20 and April 3 debriefings, Jorge Castro revealed, among other things, the following. A. According to Charles Intriago's instructions, Jorge Castro had made a $20,000 contribution to the DNC Victory Fund 92 and a $5,000 contribution to a state democratic organization for which he had been reimbursed by one of his grandfather's companies. B. According to the same instructions, Maria Cire Castro, an in-law of the Castro family, also had made a $20,000 contribution to the DNC Victory Fund 92 and a $5,000 contribution to a state democratic organization for which she had been reimbursed by one of the grandfather's companies. C. Those contributions had been made by Jorge Castro and Maria Cire Castro because they were U.S. citizens. We knew from having investigated and prosecuted the grandfather that Castroianis was not a United States citizen, and of course Jorge Castro knew that as well. D. The facts that we found in the Dominican Republic had been sent by Charles Intriago to detail the instructions concerning the contributions. E. Mr. Intriago subsequently told Jorge Castro that his $5,000 check would not be deposited and he should issue a new $5,000 check to a different state democratic organization. And F. After the replacement check had been issued, Mr. Intriago called again, advising Jorge Castro that the replacement would not be deposited either, and asking him to is issue yet a third check for $5,000 to a third state democratic organization. During his debriefing, we asked Jorge Castro why the contributions had been made. He told us that his grandfather wanted Mr. Intriago to be appointed as the United States Ambassador to the Republic of Venezuela. Mr. Castro also told us that he and his grandfather had been invited to the inauguration in January 1993 and that the grandfather and Mr. Intriago had attended a reception at the White House in October 1993. Jorge Castro said he had not been invited to the reception, but the day after the reception he attended a meeting with his grandfather, Mr. Intriago, and others at the State Department during which a purported smear campaign against the grandfather had been discussed. In May 1997, Mr. Castro met with federal prosecutors Mr. Price arranged that meeting and conducted most of the communications between our office and the Justice Department concerning this matter. Accordingly, Mr. Price will discuss these matters for you. I have one final note. During the course of a civil forfeiture case that we brought, but which was eventually dismissed by operation of law, we obtained some additional corroboration for Jorge Castro's statements, specifically in an effort to show that the judge in the forfeiture case I mean, I'm sorry, in an effort to show the judge in the forfeiture case that the Venezuelan government had confiscated all of the grandfather's properties, one of Castroianis's attorneys submitted a letter attaching a series of trust agreements between the Venezuelan equivalent of the FDIC and various companies. One of the trust agreements mentioned the entity Inversiones Latin Fien and described it in terms showing that it was indeed an entity domiciled in Venezuela. These papers, therefore, were further evidence that Castroianis had controlled the company that, according to the bank records, apparently reimbursed Jorge and Maria Cire Castro for making the contributions in question. I understand that the committee has a transcript of the sentencing of Jorge Castro, which details our reasons for our recommendation with respect to the sentence. I have little to add beyond my re remarks at the sentencing of Mr. Castro and beyond what I've already said here today. I'm at the committee's disposal, however, if there are any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Mr. Price. 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 As in sorry, the price, price is right most of the time. Okay, Mr. Price, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Richard Price. I'm an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office, where I've worked since August of 1980. In May of 1996, I was assigned to be the lead trial prosecutor in connection with the indictment against Orlando Castro Yanis, Orlando Castro Castro, and Jorge Castro Barreto. Because of the demands of the trial preparation and the trial, I did not devote much attention to the matter we had referred to the Miami U.S. Attorney's Office until that tri our trial was over. The Castro trial began on November 12, 1996, and it ended on February 19, 1997, with a guilty verdict. Beginning in March of 1997, Mr. Dawson and I both spoke with the Assistant United States Attorney from the Southern District of Florida, who was handling the Castro matter. The Assistant U.S. Attorney told us that the Florida office would handle the political contributions part of the investigation and the Southern District of New York would handle another matter related to the Castros. 
In March of 1997, we also began having conversations with the defense attorney for Jorge Castro concerning Castro's cooperation. Jorge Castro agreed to speak to us under a debriefing agreement in which we agreed not to use anything that he said as direct evidence in any prosecution against him. The first debriefing took place on March 20, 1997, and we met with him again on April 3, 1997. And Mr. Dawson has summarized the information that Mr. Castro provided to us during those two meetings. We eventually secured defense counsel's consent on behalf of his client to tell the federal prosecutors what Jorge Castro had told us. We then disclosed the nature and extent of Jorge Castro's cooperation to the federal prosecutors, and I arranged to have Jorge Castro produced from jail to our offices for a meeting with the federal prosecutors on May 28, 1997. On that date, May 28, 1997, before the meeting, I spoke to a second assistant U.S. attorney from the Southern District of Florida who had come to the meeting because his colleague was on trial and also an FBI agent, FBI agent who was with him. I told them, among other things, what Castro had told us in general terms, what my impressions were, and that there was a potential statute of limitations issue since the events in question had taken place in the fall of 1992. Castro was debriefed by the assistant U.S. attorney from Miami, two assistant U.S. attorneys from the Southern District of New York, an IRS agent, and, an FBI, and the FBI agent. Two investigators from our office were present because Mr. Castro was still in custody at that time. Neither Mr. Dawson nor I stayed for the entire interview. In fact, I was present for only a few minutes in total. After the meeting, the federal prosecutors left, but the IRS agents stayed behind for a day or two to review documents in our files, and we made those documents available to him. A week or so later, I received a call from the second assistant U.S. attorney from, from the Southern District of Florida, and he thanked me for our cooperation and our courtesy. He told me he thought the case deserved a thorough investigation, that his office intended to give the case a close look, and that he was confident that the investigation into the alleged political contributions could be completed by the date upon which we all theorized that the statute of limitations might run. And that, among all concerned, was generally regarded to be September 16, 1997, the fifth anniversary of the date appearing on the facts that our office had found in the Dominican Republic. In the latter part of June or early July of 1997, I received a phone call from the defense attorney for Jorge Castro. He told me that the second assistant U.S. attorney had left the Southern District of, New of Florida to work with the independent counsel's office and that the Office of Public Integrity of the United States Justice Department had removed the political contributions case from the Southern District of Florida and that as far as he could tell, nothing was being done with the case. He expressed concern that the statute of limitations would run and that his client would be left to face the sentencing judge without anything to show for his cooperation. He also said that he had spoken to the chief of the public integrity section of the Department of Justice. After calling the Southern District of Florida and confirming that the case had been transferred by Washington to public integrity, I called the chief of the public integrity section but was not put through to him, and I asked that the person handling the Castro case return my call. Within a week or so, I received a phone call from a trial attorney assigned to the Campaign Financing Task Force. He told me he had the notes and documents from the debriefing of Jorge Castro by the federal prosecutors in our office on May 28, 1997. I invited him to come to New York to speak to Jorge Castro, review the documents, and discuss the case with Mr. Dawson and me. And I told him that we were prepared to ask the sentencing judge to put off Castro's sentence. He said he did not want to speak with Mr. Castro, but he did want to review the documents we had and speak with us. On July 23, 1997, the task force attorney came to the district attorney's office with the same FBI agent who had come to the office on May 28 for the debriefing of Jorge Castro. We explained what we knew about the Castro's political contributions and showed him the documents that corroborated Jorge Castro's statements. I reiterated that we would continue to put off Jorge Castro's sentencing date for as long as necessary and asked him to let us know as soon as possible whether and to what extent Castro would be used in the investigation. He and the FBI agent left my office in the late afternoon taking some documents with them that had been photocopied. On August 19, 1997 and September 23, 1997, we asked for and were granted adjournments of the sentencing date for Jorge Castro. On September 4, 1997, in response to a call from the task force attorney, I sent him a letter enclosing additional documents he requested, including our original copies of the checks. I asked him to let us know when a decision had been made 
and I asked him to call Mr. Dawson if he had any question because I would be away beginning the following week. I think the committee has a copy of that letter, Mr. Chairman. When I returned to the office on September 22, 1997, I called the task force attorney's office several times and left messages asking what was happening with the case. In response, he left a message on my voicemail one evening thanking me for my patience and asking me to hold off on the sentencing. Defense counsel and I again agreed to ask the court to postpone the sentence, this time until October 20, 1997, and the court granted that adjournment request. On October 10, 1997, I sent a letter to the task force attorney stating in substance that Castro was scheduled to be sentenced on October 20, 1997. I inquired whether the Department of Justice intended to make any submissions to the sentencing court and requested that a copy of any such submissions be sent to us before the sentencing date. I also asked him to advise us if he wanted a delay in the sentencing so that we could tell the sentencing judge. I believe, that, Mr. Chairman, you have a copy of that letter as well. Before I, heard back, before I heard back from the Justice Department, Defense Counsel for Jorge Castro and I agreed to postpone the sentence one more time from October 20, 1997 until December 15, 1997, and again, the Supreme Court in our, in our county granted the adjournment. On October 17, 1997, I received a phone call from Defense Counsel advising me that he had received a copy of a fax letter from the Chief of the Public Integrity Section of the Justice Department. He told me that the letter had been addressed to me and that he had been CC'd on the letter. I believe the committee also has a copy of that letter. Defense Counsel faxed that letter to me and I received it directly later the next week. The letter stated that the Department of Justice would not be requesting another adjournment of Castro's sentence and would not be making a submission to the sentencing court. The letter went on to state, and I quote, we have concluded that there is at this time no further role for him to play in matters under investigation by the task force, end quote. On December 15, 1997, Mr. Castro was sentenced and we've provided a copy of the sentencing minutes to the committee and I'll do my best to answer any questions that members of the committee have. Thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, counsel? Mr. Price, Mr. Dawson, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, Mr. Price, my understanding you've been a prosecutor with the Office of uh, District Attorney Morgenthau for 18 years, is that correct? It'll be 18 years on August 18th. And Mr. Dawson, you've been uh, a prosecutor in uh, District Attorney Morgenthau's office for approximately 10 years, is that correct? It'll be 11 in September. Mr. Dawson, in your professional opinion, was there enough evidence of illegal conduit contributions to justify a thorough investigation of the, Cast of the Castro conduit payments to the Democratic National Committee and to state Democratic parties? Well, <laughs> I'm not a federal prosecutor, so I may not be as familiar with the federal statutes in question to give you a professional opinion in that regard. But given your review of the information that you had uh, discovered in your investigation and your at least cursory review of federal statutes, you thought there was something that should be investigated. Is that correct? That's why we referred it. I, I, before we get into some of the things that were discussed this morning, I'd like to just um, ask you some questions about Mr. Castro's testimony this morning. Uh, I noticed that you were sitting in the back and um, heard all of Mr. Castro's testimony. Um, and Mr. Dawson and Mr. Price, you've both had a number of discussions with Mr. Castro prior to today, is that correct? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Has Mr. Castro ever told you anything about conduit contributions that has later proven to be false? No. No. Awesome. In uh, the testimony provided this morning to this committee, um, was Mr. Castro's testimony consistent with what he has told you in the past? Price? Yes, for the most part. I mean, not word for word, but yes. I mean, the substance of what he said today is the substance of what I've heard on previous occasions. Yes, I would I, agree with that. There, there were some matters, I suppose, that you didn't ask, but he didn't volunteer. Fine. And um, again, uh, I'll ask Mr. Dawson first. Is the testimony that you heard this morning consistent with the documentary evidence that you have reviewed in the past about the Castro conduit payments? Yes, I believe so. Mr. Price? Yes. If we could, uh, I'd like to put up exhibit VEN-2 on the screen in front of you. And I'd just like to ask you, you indicated, Mr. Dawson, just now that uh, there might have been some things that Mr. Castro did not cover. 
uh, were there any things that, uh, that you thought should have been illuminated during his testimony that wasn't regarding this? No, Mr. Chairman, the thing that I was, I was thinking about was the remark that he had made to us about uh, the grandfather saying something about wanting Intriago to be the ambassador to Venezuela. I don't recall hearing that this morning. I don't but, think you but asked. You, re you recall Mr. Castro saying that uh, about his grandfather? Uh, but the, yes, not in Triago, mind you. The grandfather had said it to him at, at, at some point. I see. Was there any further illumination of that issue? No, I don't think so. Do you, re do you remember well, anything? Well, what, what I remember is, is that when we were interviewing him, one of the questions that we thought was sort of obvious was, well, you know, why, were these, why were these contributions made? And he, he, what he said to us was that he, he thought, sorry, what he said to us was that his grandfather had told him that he wanted, Char he referred to him as Charlie, to be appointed ambassador of the United States to Vene the Republic of Venezuela. And so that was the initial reason why the campaign contributions were funneled up through his uh, relatives in Miami. That, that's what he told us, his, that's what he told us, what the real reason was or whether that was the reason, Mr. Chairman, I really don't know. But I can only tell you what Mr. Castro told us. Okay, thank you. Referring to the uh, document on the screen in front of you, and, and, and Mr. Price and Mr. Dawson, the screens are sometimes hard to read. In front of you, you have black uh, binders with um, materials in them. And if you'd like to refer directly to the copies of the documents in those binders, you might find it uh, easier to follow some of the documents. And we're looking at uh, VEN-2, the second exhibit in the book. Right. Um, and it, it, it is a fax from a CM Triago to Mr. Jorge Castro. And Mr. Castro did testify before this committee earlier today, and he spoke at great length about this fax. And I'd like to ask you both a few questions about this fax. And first of all, Mr. Dawson, um, in your opening statement, you made a reference to the fax. Uh, if you could please describe how you found it. I was in the office of what was identified to me as a secretary's office, the secretary being uh, Jorge Castro's secretary. Um, I believe he had two, one that was a secretary and one that was a, a, a secretary or an assistant of some kind, in any event. Uh, there were two filing cabinets um, which were sealed by the Dominican authorities. The entire building had been sealed, actually. Uh, we got upstairs. We asked to look through this filing cabinet or both filing cabinets. We looked through the desks. We looked through everything, basically. And this was... Um, I found this in a, in a file in one of the two filing cabinets. Moving from the, the micro to the macro, what country uh, was the office in? Oh, uh, the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo. It was the office of Banco Latino Americano. Okay. And is it correct to say that at that point uh, the offices had been vacated by Mr. Castro and his staff? This was in February 1996. The bank uh, I was told was closed in December 1994 and had been under the continuous custody of the Superintendent of Banking of the Dominican Republic. If we could, I'd like to focus on some of the specific entries in this fax. Um, if you'd take a look at it, uh, underneath the uh, word comment, it reads 20-DNC uh, Victory Fund 92 uh, Fed account, and then in parentheses U. And uh, Mr. Price, based on the evidence that you've reviewed, and your discussions with Mr. Castro, um, what does this represent? It represents a fact entry that says exactly what it says. Um, DNC Victory Fund, as I read it, means Democratic National Committee Victory Fund 92. FED account, parentheses, U. You can draw a conclusion from that if you want. And in this case, the U refers to um, Mr. Castro, is that correct? You can draw that conclusion from what it says. Fair enough. The, the next line um, has essentially the same entry, and in parentheses, uh, the entry, uh, Maria. Based on what you have subsequently learned, um, to whom does Maria refer? Well, based upon what Mr. Castro told us, you referred to him. Maria referred to his relative, Maria Sir Castro, S-I-R-E, Castro. And... Um, did Mr. Castro ever tell either of you why Mr. Entriago wanted Castro and other of his family members to make the political contributions described in this fax? Because what he told us was that the contributions were made because he 
and Maria Sear Castro were U.S. citizens and they could make the contributions legally, but a foreigner could not. That's what he told us. That's the substance of what he told us in our interviews with him. Okay. Now, we, we have been provided a great deal of documentary evidence about bank transfers that seem to indicate a reimbursement of money, and I don't want to go through and belabor these too much right now, but um, I'll ask this of both of you. Mr. Dawson, first, how do you know that um, Mr. Castro and his aunt were reimbursed for the checks that they wrote? That is a conclusion that we're drawing based on having found the facts, having seen the checks that were attached to it at the time, having subpoenaed certain bank records afterward, and having realized that eight days after the date of the facts, both of them were reimbursed through very similar wire transfers emanating from the same source. Okay, and, and I'll hopefully be true to my word. I don't want to belabor these, but let's just put up VEN-12 on the screen in front of us if we can, and if you'll take a look at that. Um, right. You referred just then to uh, bank transfer statements. Uh, this bank transfer statement in front of you indicates that on September 24, a deposit of $24,990 was made into the account of uh, Mr. Jorge Castro. I is this one of the uh, transfer state statements that you were referring to just a moment ago? Uh, yes. Uh, what you have to realize is that we had subpoenaed bank records and had them coming in separately. This says miscellaneous credit. Um, I don't recall whether we got this one first or the Maria Sire Castro one first, but when you get the Maria Sire Castro, Castro one, you realize that it's a wire transfer through Chase New York, through something called Inversiones Latin Fiend. We see the same date, same amount. Um, on Jorge's statement, we, what we then do is subpoena Chase Manhattan Bank and actually get the, the uh, wire transfer documentation. And then we find, with respect to both accounts, both amounts came through wire transfers through Chase, New York, by order of Inversiones Latin Fin in Venezuela. I'll take just a break for a moment. Uh, Chairman Burton has some yes, questions. Yes, I have a, a couple of questions on, uh, on another subject. Uh, you made a lot of uh, con uh, calls and, and, and uh, contacts with uh, various members of the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney in, in southern part of Florida, uh, the people, I guess, uh, up in Washington. Can you give me, in your own words, your feeling? Was there a sense of frustration uh, because they weren't taking proper actions when you knew that the statute of limitations was about to run? Well, <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Chairman, I don't know what the Department of Justice was doing. Uh, my, what I was trying to do was, was accomplish two objectives. First objective was to keep my superiors in my office informed as to what was going on based upon a matter that we referred to the Department of Justice. Well, actually, originally referred to two US one U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida. The second problem I had was that the other two, def the other two defendants had already been sentenced, and the, and the sentencing judge, as is his province, wanted to know if he was ever going to get around to sentencing Jorge Castro. Um, and so I wanted to be able to come back to him and give him an answer as to why, whether he would be sentencing him, and if not, why. So. Since I didn't get an answer to those two questions, I guess you could say I was a little frustrated. So in your opinion, what, what action should have been taken uh, by justice uh, in, in those cases, in that case? Well, um, that, that's a very you hard question. You've probably been through this before with the Justice Department in other cases, have well, you not? You know, the Justice Department does business in a certain way, um, in various ways, really, and we do business in various ways, too. It's hard for me to answer your question um, because I really don't understand how things work inside the Justice Department. I'm a state prosecutor in New York State. Uh, my office uh, is, is run in such a way where if, if I need to speak to someone in, in, a, in a higher position, I, I'm, I'm granted relatively easy access. Um, I, th I think our office obviously is a little smaller than the Department of Justice. Um, so I, I really don't, I, I don't know how I can answer your question other than to say I don't understand how they do, how, what their decision-making process is, how the bureaucracy works how they're organized, okay, so let me it's hard for way. me to answer that. How, how many times did you contact uh, people at the Justice Department regarding uh, your concern about the statute of limitations running? Well, um, I, I spoke to 
Mr. Do Mr. Dawson spoke to an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida on March 11th. I happen to remember that date because uh, that's the date I went away on vacation to England after having spent ten and a half months working seven days a week preparing for and trying this case. So I remember that date. I wasn't in New York, so I wasn't privy to that conversation. Several other conversations I had with that assistant U.S. attorney, we talked about the statute of limitations. We talked about whether the three-year statute applied or the five-year statute applied. It was lawyer talk. I mean, the, the federal prosecutors obviously lawyer. We're lawyers. We talked about that. Um, we talked about it. I, I spoke to a, a, the second assistant U.S. attorney who came up from the Southern District of Florida on May 28, 1997. That's the date when various federal prosecutors came to our office. We produced Mr. Castro for interview, and I, I, I did discuss the statute of limitations with him on that day. Did, 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 you, did you at any time uh, indicate to them that since the statute of limitations was about to run out, that uh, they ought to uh, look into Mr. Entriago and maybe have uh, him at least uh, uh, talked to by FBI agents? Uh, the answer to that question is no, I didn't, nor would I have thought that to be an appropriate thing to do, Mr. Chairman, um, any more than I'd want a federal prosecutor telling me how to run my investigation, frankly. Well, I understand, and I think that's, uh, that's probably good advice, but uh, were you concerned about that? I, I, was con I was concerned about two things, keeping my superiors informed as to what was happening with the referral and letting the judge know what was going on. Um, the judge that tried this case is, I think, known as fairly independent, and he, has a, and he has a point of view about certain things. And I wanted to be able to answer his questions. And, and, and my immediate concern was to be able to tell my superiors what was going on with the referral, because we had referred the case I believe in the fall of 1996, as we were getting ready, as we were getting <coughs> cranked up to try this this case, which was going to be a major league production, mm -hmm. it was a long trial. Sure. So, you know, my my main concern, frankly, was to, was to was to accomplish my two objectives. Yeah. I didn't really, I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on inside the Department okay, I, of Justice because I, I didn't know. Did 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 you were you concerned that Mr. Antriago may have been a, 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 a major part of this money laundering operation and should have been looked at in your own mind? Well, I, I can tell you that the reason that the case was referred to the federal prosecutor in, 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 the, in the Southern District of Florida was because we thought it was something they might be interested in. So that's why we gave it to them. We said, Here's the, the, the documents that we have. Now, remember, there's two steps to this, okay? Step one is the documents. The documents go down in the fall of 96. The docu Mr. Dawson can speak to what the documents said because he found them. Right. Then, in, then uh, later on, Mr. Jorge Castro, the gentleman who testified here earlier today, he comes into the picture. Well, I, I guess the point I want to make, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not getting my point across, is you already had Jorge Castro convicted. He was going to go to jail. So when you referred this to the federal authorities, you were talking to them about Mr. Entriago more than Mr. Castro. Is that correct, or was well, it Mr. Castro? The referral had occurred much earlier, Mr. Chairman. That's the point I was trying to get to. It was the fall of 96 that the referral was made. And Jorge Castro wasn't convicted until February 19th, 1997. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after that that we actually spoke to him. So that's but why was, I was having but trouble. But he was convicted, and you, were, you knew the statute was running on the whole case. We thought it was. You thought it was. And, uh, can you, and, and, and what I'm getting at is that by the time you started being concerned about the statute running, it was well into 1997. You knew it was September 12th that it was going to run out, and you were talking to them. Was Mr. Entriago one of your concerns? Well, I don't know that, I, that we knew that it was going to run out. That I know, it was a potential was, what, issue. But was one of your concerns that, that you wanted to make sure that uh, if there was going to be any action taken, it was taken on Mr. or looked into on Mr. Entriago as well as Mr. Castro before the statute ran? Mr. Castro Yanis? I'm sorry, as well as Mr. Castro, you said. The gentleman said, that was here today. Oh. Um, we just we just wanted something. We had referred it, and we knew that there was this potential issue. I, mean, I, I don't want to. Clearly, we were interested in what was going to happen. We were interested because we referred the case. We thought, thought it was a Mr. serious Entriago matter, and that's why we referred it. You thought Mr. Entriago should have been investigated. We thought that the that matter if, should have been. We thought that the matter should be investigated, um, in, including Mr. Entriago. Well, I mean, it, to be well, to be honest with you, Mr. Chairman, we had already looked into some of um, Mr. Entriago's transactions ourselves, and we had referred all of this stuff. So, so I guess it's, it's no secret that 
we, this was um, among, I suppose, that he would be among the matters that we had referred. You thought it was worth them looking at? Absolutely. That's why we referred it. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. okay. Uh, I think my time's about to run out, at least my first 20 minutes. I've got 10, and I'll, I'll go very quickly just to follow up on something uh, the Chairman was discussing, that, discussing then. Um, Mr. Price, it's my understanding that, that Mr. Castro's lawyer had a conversation with the head of the DOJ Public Integrity Section after the case was taken from the Florida prosecutors and lodged at the Department of Justice. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. That's what uh, Mr. Prosc Mr., uh, yeah, Mr. Castro's lawyer told me. And, and we're speaking of Mr. Lee Radick, who is the head of the Public Integrity Section. That's who he told me he spoke to. Now, Mr. Price, did you try and have a conversation with Mr. Radick? Yes. Uh, what was the result? I was not put through to him. Um, now, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were told that Mr. Radick would not speak to anyone unless they had a referral number for the case, correct? That's correct. And do you know whether Mr. Castro's lawyer had such a referral number? Uh, if he did, he didn't give it to me. Did anybody ever give you a referral number for this case? No, I, I don't think we were ever given a referral number. I don't think anybody had a referral number. Maybe there was a referral number inside the Department of Justice, but again, I, I wouldn't be privy to that, so I don't know. Right, but Mr. Castro's attorney was not uh, an employee of the Department of Justice, so he was on the same No, he was not, a, he was not an employee of the Department of Justice. <laughs> okay. Um, and and I, I'm, I don't know whether this is a question you can answer or not, but um, were you concerned at the time that Mr. Castro's <coughs> attorney was given uh, more attentive treatment at the highest levels of the Department of Justice than you? Well, I mean, I, I thought that at the time, I, I think I said in the conversation that I couldn't understand why Mr. the defense attorney's phone call could be taken the day before, but mine couldn't be, and I was a prosecutor and he was a defense lawyer. I think that's what I said to the person who answered the phone. Fair enough. I think that speaks for itself. I'll finish my first 20 minutes now by with one other question. Um, Mr. Price or Mr. Dawson, do you know whether any, any of the Castro family attorneys, and bear in mind for everybody that there were three Castro family members who were uh, under investigation and ultimately convicted, but do you know whether any of the Castro family attorneys, such as Judge Tyler in New York, uh, were given meetings at the Department of Justice prior to the decision to drop the case? Uh, that is a very difficult question to answer depending on how you limit the time. Are you talking back in 1988, 1990, 1992? Or are you talking between the time of the conviction and the time of the sentencing? Actually, just limit it from the time of the conviction until the time Mr. Radick, Radick uh, wrote a letter addressed to Mr. I Price. have no information on any of that. Then. Could I ask just one question? I'm not going to have my time in a minute, but we have to vote. Do you know whether the case was dropped by the Justice Department? Because the attorney just our counsel for our committee said, the counsel for the committee just said uh, uh, that the case had been dropped. Do you know where I, the case Actually, I apologize. You're right. That was, the, that was the way the question was phrased, and I should have caught it, and I didn't. I don't know that the case has been dropped. But, but and, and, and the reason that we don't know, Mr. Waxman, is because we've never, we've never asked, nor have we been told. Yeah. We, we got that, I got that letter from Mr. Raddick, and that told me what I needed to know. And we proceeded to sentence on December 15th with Mr. Castro. I want to recess and come back after that. Uh, we will stand in recess and come back just as quick. We're going to have two votes on the floor, so we'll be gone about 15 minutes. So. Thank, you. Thank you for bearing with us. Stand in recess to fall again. Convene. I'm sorry, Mr. Price and Mr. Dawson took so long. Uh, where were we on when we recessed? Uh, I think, Henry, you were about to. Uh, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Mr. Waxman. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price and Mr. Dawson, uh, I don't know if you get many thank yous in your job, but I want to thank you for the job that you have done in prosecuting the underlying bank fraud and, uh, and trying to make sure that if there's any criminal offense that is pursued. That's exactly what we want from our prosecutors, and I want you to know that I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh,
the, the evidence that you've described for us uh, is pretty clear that there wasn't, it appears that there was an illegal foreign contribution. Uh, we have the bank records which show that Mr. Castro and his aunt were reimbursed from Venezuela, and, uh, and you found different other corroborating evidence to, uh, uh, to fill in the blanks so that I think we've got a picture of a foreign contribution. Uh, what is less clear is whether or not Mr. Intriago was a part of this. In fact, besides Mr. Castro's testimony, the only hard evidence of Mr. Intriago's involvement is the facts and Mr. Intriago's phone number on one of the checks. But neither the facts nor the check mentions anything about a reimbursement. So in terms of Mr. Intriago's activities, the evidence leads us to, I think, several possibilities, and I want to explore them with you. The first possibility is that Charles Intriago arranged for Jorge Castro, a U.S. citizen, uh, to make a political contribution for his Venezuelan grandfather. If he did that, that would be illegal. That's a foreign contribution. Well, I was just pausing because we hear a lot of bells, but it looks like we're not being summoned to the House floor, and perhaps we're even in recess. So one possibility is it was a, that, that uh, Intriago was responsible for it. The second possibility is Mr. Intriago promised that he would arrange for uh, Mr. Castro's grandfather to get a picture taken with the President, and in return, uh, a contribution from Mr. Castro. Now, that would be unseemly if he went out and got a contribution from Mr. Castro and then told the grandfather, I'm going to go and arrange for you to get a photo with the president at this big gathering. But it wouldn't be illegal. That wouldn't be illegal. The third possibility is that Mr. Intriago solicited a contribution from his friend's grandson, who was a U.S. citizen. Mr. Intriago had given money himself to the Democratic Party in the election campaign. And he went to Mr. young Mr. Castro and said, I want you to give some money to the Democrats. He knew he had money. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because that's how fundraisers work. They go out and solicit contributions. So um, what I want to know is what evidence is there other than Mr. Castro's testimony that leads you to conclude that what happened might be that first possibility as opposed to the second or the third? Uh, can I have a moment, please? Sure. In other words, the question I'm asking is, do we have a case that we have one person's word against another? Well, it depends on how vigorously you pursue leads that are out there, I suppose. So you think if there are certain leads that might have been pursued? Or might? Or might not have been pursued or may have led nowhere. Or might be still being, being pursued. Or exactly, might still be a being anything's pursued. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. <clears throat> Um, so I, I can't really answer which one of these three alternatives you've posed. It, it definitely is. Yeah. But when you say, is there any evidence out there, I can answer that question several different ways. There is evidence. There's evidence that, that and you can draw conclusions from those evidence. But as a prosecutor, in your case, and then the Justice Department, they have to look at the evidence and see how strong a case, pursue other leads to see if they can get some more Correct. information. And those leads have been supplied to the Justice Department. And what they're doing with it, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it takes time sometimes for the Justice Department to move, and it's frustrating. I know from my own experience that I chaired a hearing where the CEOs of the major tobacco companies came in, they raised their hand to tell the truth, and then sat there and lied. And the Justice Department, that was four years ago. And the Justice Department is still investigating whether to bring perjury charges. Now, I understand perjury is a very definitive 
criminal offense. You've got to prove all the elements as you do in any criminal prosecution. They don't want to move precipitously. It, I could respect the fact that uh, they want to make sure the case is, is, going to, is going to stick if they're going to bring the charges. But I must say, four years is a long time, and I wish they'd bring the charges if they're going to bring them. But if I ask the Justice Department what, what they're doing, their response is, we're investigating. Right. And evidently, they are still investigating because they haven't said that, the, uh, that they've closed the uh, a case. Uh, in, in your case or in this case? Well, in, in, the, in, the, in the tobacco case. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I asked you earlier, they, didn't, they haven't made any announcements that closed an investigation in this case. Right. All they've said is they don't want to use a certain witness. Okay. And um, there, there appears to be a good reason that the Justice Department won't want to be cautious. And uh, they don't want to make accusations that are not supported by the evidence. So the case come, they may look at this case as coming down to one person's word against another. Well, I, I, I and that's awfully tough to bring, isn't it? Okay. Well, I, I'm not confronting you. I'm just speculating with you. Oh, if you're speculating, then you're not asking me a question. So I'll, I'm I'll, speculating with you because I don't know and you don't know what's going on in the Justice Department. We, I think we can agree that you and I don't know what's going on in the Justice Department. At least I can agree that I don't. What, what you know, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why they weren't asked to come today, because I, we could ask them directly uh, what, what, uh, what's happening with their investigation. I, the chairman didn't invite them, and he said he's going to invite them. I don't know why we need another day of hearing on, on that, but uh, we don't know what theories or charges the Justice Department may be considering in this case. and. Um, and, and, that's where, and that's where things stand. But I wanted to ask you uh, a, a, a couple other questions. When you talked to Mr. Castro early on, and he talked about Mr. Intiago, was he hostile about Mr. Andy, Intiago? No. You, you, you didn't see it? No. no, in fact, it came out only a bit later, uh, probably in the second, maybe the third time that we spoke to him, that I got the definite impression that he didn't like him, as he said, he didn't like him professionally. He liked him personally, as far as I could tell. Yeah, he, he didn't express any hostility toward Mr. Intriago on a personal level. I think he, I, th I remember him saying one thing along the lines of he charged a lot of money but didn't do very much. Charged his grandfather a lot of money but didn't do very much. Um, and that's probably Sounds something like you that's hear. what his grandfather thought about uh, him. I right? mean, I've heard that said about several lawyers, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> Now, was there any evidence in this whole bank collapse business and fraud, that there was drug money involved? It wasn't in the indictment and it wasn't part of the trial and, 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 had, and there was nothing at all that was related to that as, part, as far as our indictment or our trial were concerned. Right. We looked into some allegations. Now, do you know that whether Mr. Castro, while he was in prison, was fearful of his safety, for his safety? We can tell you what he told us which was that he was concerned that, um, that a, uh, he didn't want something in, stuck in his back in the showers <laughs> because he would be labeled as a rat or a snitch uh, for coming before anybody, whether, it's, whether it was a court or the Congress or anybody else. He expressed concern for his physical safety if he were to testify as a witness. He made that clear um, pretty early on. Uh, and you don't know whether there was a reason for him to feel that way, but well, that if, was a statement he made. Well, if, if well, it, there's you, always you, that concern. There, there's always that concern. Because, I don't know if you're familiar with the New York State correctional facilities, but there are no uh, Allen Woods in our in our state penal system. Uh, what I'm suggesting to you is is that whether you're in a low security, in the, as has been explained to me, whether you're in a low security facility, a medium secure facility, or a high security facility, um, you're, you're you're basically around people who have committed all sorts of crimes, including murder and drug dealing, and, and some of these people are not very nice people. And, and people, the, the, if you have a reputation, if you acquire a reputation as being someone who has cooperated with law enforcement, you're not going to be very popular. So his fear, as you understood it, was that someone would see him ratting on anybody else, just cooperating with law enforcement. Not that he thought Mr. Intriago or someone He never expressed a concern about Mr. Yeah. Intriago harming him, if that's what you're asking me. Yeah. He never did that. Did he express any concern that the President of the United States or the Democratic National Committee would get somebody in prison to hurt him? No. It's a little ludicrous, isn't it? Pardon me? That would be a little ludicrous, wouldn't it? 
I, I can only tell you what he told me, Mr. Waxman, and what he didn't tell me, and he certainly didn't say that. Were you surprised at his testimony uh, this morning uh, when we asked him whether he, uh, whether he would admit to having done the things for which he had been accused and, and convicted? I thought he did admit it. He did? Okay, he, did, he may not have stood up and said, okay, everyone, I did it, and thrown up his hands, but I think that's, you got as pretty close as you can get. Um, if there's a foreign contribution, it's illegal. We would hope illegal contributions would be, uh, illegal acts would be prosecuted. This isn't really a question to you, but a statement. The fact of the matter is that that should be the pursued no matter where it may have come from. And my complaint with this investigation is I don't hear anybody talking about foreign contributions that might have come to Republicans. The chairman said most of them would have been to Democrats. Well, I, I, I can't accept that. Uh, we know about a couple examples. We know that Haley Barber, who was head of the Republican National Campaign Committee, solicited a contribution from a foreign uh, national by the name of Ambrose Young. Uh, there was a case of Mr. Uh, Thomas Kramer who gave to the Republican Party in Miami. Uh, I believe that there are illegal campaign contributions that go on in elections, and I don't like it. I want to reform this whole campaign finance system, but I can't understand why anybody would reach the conclusion that if you're going to investigate foreign contributions, that it'll only be with respect to Democrats. There are members of Congress that receive contributions because of their activities on foreign policy issues. And they could advocate the cause of Pakistan or Cuba or some other country, and they may receive contributions from presumably Americans who support that point of view, but they don't know for sure if they receive a contribution, if it really came from an American citizen, it could have been, could have been laundered. Well, there's no way you'd know, unless you did know, but there's just no way that a member of Congress would know it, and it doesn't appear there's any way the President or the Democratic Party would know from the face of having received that contribution from uh, Mr. Castro. Uh, I, uh, I, th I thank you for your testimony. I think you've been giving us uh, your views, and I want to yield some time to Mr. Barrett uh, to uh, pursue any questions he Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, one of the discussions earlier today that I think someone would be concerned with is the whole issue of the statute of limitations. Um, and I think, Mr. Price, you spent more time talking about the statute of limitations. And help me with this. It's my understanding that there's a five-year statute of limitations on the illegal contributions. Is that, is that correct? No, that's, no, not that's correct. wrong. It's a three-year okay. statute. Three-year statute. We looked it up. Okay. So the, how did the, that five-year, when you said you looked it up, you looked up just now or you looked it up? No, we, we looked it up before, but actually, I think Mr. Dawson is in a better position okay. to answer your question since Whatever. she actually did some of the legal research on the, it more of this than I did. Actually, this, this uh, relates to something someone had asked earlier about a conversation with one of the U.S. attorneys in Florida, I believe, that our, my first conversation. We had discussed all of this, what you had just raised. My concern when I spoke to him was that this is, in fact, a three-year statute, and therefore, before I even found this fax in the Dominican Republic, the statute would have been blown or, or run. Um, I also did some research, uh, though, <laughs> and uh, the law seems to be that, yes, this is a three-year statute, but uh, one can prosecute under the general criminal statutes, like 1001, um, and, and then it would be a five-year statute, and there's no problem with that whatsoever. So that's why it, 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 we regarded it, we theorized that it was a five-year statute, and we used the date of the facts as, as sort of the baseline for that in our conversations. Would, would there be a possibility, and again, I would, I would be concerned if I felt that the case would be blown by, by um, the running of the statute of limitations. Blown was an unfortunate choice of words on my That's part. That's all right. I, I used it as well. I'm not offended by it. Uh, what about a conspiracy charge? Same deal. It would be a five-year statute. We, we talked about these, about these theories with the, the, assistant US, the first assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Florida. We, 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 this was the lawyer talk I alluded to earlier, I think, when I was answering one of the chairman's questions. We talked about different theories that, that a prosecution could be brought under, such as perhaps mail fraud, wire fraud. Those, as I understand it, are five-year statutes of limitation 
cases, whereas the uh, illegal contributions is a three-year statute. We went back and forth on all this. And what you have to appreciate is, is that most prosecutors aren't going to, like if there's a close question of whether the statute is going to run in September or October, a good prosecutor is going to assume it's going to run in September because they don't want to find out later that he was wrong. And the, and the prosecutor in, in Florida was, was attuned to this. In fact, he didn't just mention mail fraud and wire fraud. He said, well, I can look into RICO and, and money laundering and things like that. He, he, was, he was very definite on there were ways to get around this, and, and we all sort of concluded it wasn't a three-year statute. It was a five-year statute, depending on how the charges, if there were to be any, uh, were to be structured. And so there would be a, there's a five-year statute, uh, statute of limitations on the general federal General crimes. General yes. crimes. And, and that could be told, however. Could yes, that's another. That's okay. That's something we haven't talked about. Exactly. And again, my understanding of the conspiracy law is that if it's a continuing criminal activity, that it would be told during that period, which arguably would extend it beyond September of 1997. Was that something that was discussed, or is that something that you think could no, be No. In my own train of thought, basically, I was focused more on New York tolling provisions just in case, and I had sort of had those in the back of my mind. We didn't really need to discuss it during the March 97 conversation with the AUSA in Miami that I participated in, because really there was plenty of time, it was nine months. No, no, one, no one talked about in, in the conversations I, I had with the assistant U.S. attorney from the Southern District of Florida, no one talked about a tolling provision. Everybody assumed that because the date of the facts was what it was, that that would be, that would be the cutoff. Arguably, you could say that until the checks were actually paid, when the funds were actually drawn out of the accounts, arguably that may have been October. But in the conversations that I had with the assistant U.S. attorney from the Southern District of Florida, we never discussed tolling provisions. It never came up, and, and frankly, I don't know if there would have been any reason for it to come up. Okay, but but is it possible that the Justice Department here, looking at the case, might take a different interpretation, even though it wasn't something that was discussed by the Assistant U.S. Attorney in in Florida? You should to probably take... ask them. <laughs> okay. I don't I don't know. I mean, you should you should ask them. Okay, who would have been the likely target of an indictment here? You should ask them. Yes. Okay. Well, there, there are obvious targets. There's Mr. Castro. He would be part of a money laundering conspiracy. His grandfather, his aunt, right? These are people involved, and Mr. Intiago. Well, I don't know if I'd call it a money laundering conspiracy. I don't know if the election violation is a predicate act for purposes of well, look, that statute. I, the problem is we're not federal prosecutors, so we're not in a position to really opine for you what the state of federal law if, is. If I may, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, to let you know what I'm driving at, if, if Mr. Intiago was... Intriago. Intriago, thank you, was a likely um, defendant or person who could be indicted, I, I read the, the letter that we received, or that I've got a copy of here, April 16th, saying, saying that, that the Justice Department does not want immunity given him I read that as saying that he is still someone that the Justice Department is looking at. Am, am I reading that incorrectly? And what would be the... It's one way to read it, certainly. I mean, that, that, that would make sense to me, but what's in their minds, I can't testify about that. And I, and I can't either, because they're the ones that have to make these decisions. They're the ones that, if they're, if they're thinking about these things, they should, maybe they can come in here and tell you, or, or maybe they, they, they can't, I don't, I don't know. Okay, well, again, I'm asking you to help me in the sense that if the Justice Department, again, this is two weeks ago today, told Mr. Bennett that, that it was opposed to granting immunity to Mr. Intiago, Intriago, excuse me. Am I incorrect in inferring that he may still be a, a target? I think that what you have to recognize is that we referred two matters to two different offices. We referred the campaign matter to the uh, Southern District of Florida, and we referred other matters to the Southern District of New York. I don't know what's happening in the Southern District of New York. Perhaps the immunity letter relates to that. I don't know. You, again, you'd have to ask them. Okay. Do you think something's wrong here? <laughs> wrong with, there have been so many things flying back and forth here today. I don't know what it, you mean by that. It isn't, when you, 
as I understand the question, you're asking us to, to opine on whether there's something wrong. Um, I, I, Mr. Mr. Barrett, I would think that that's probably something for you and the committee to do, not for us to do. Yeah, in fact, I had to make an application before a judge to get the documents before the committee, and I had to uh, basically uh, discuss the uh, resolution that was passed and, and the report and, and basically say, look, as you said at sentencing, Judge, uh, it's not for me, it's not for Mr. Price, it's not for Jorge Castro's defense counsel, and it's not for uh, Justice McLaughlin uh, to say uh, what, what went on here, and, to, or, and it's not our position to question what was going on with respect to the Justice Department, but I took the position in the application to get you the documents that it's the House Reform, House Government Reform and Oversight Committee that has responsibilities for overseeing these matters, and therefore, it's in the public interest to provide the committee with these documents. We've okay, given them well, to you. Okay, well, let me, I mean, you understand what this, what's going on here. Uh, well, why don't you explain it to us? So I'll explain it to you. You've got, you've got our chairman here who I think, and I'll even let the, the chairman inter, interject if I stated incorrectly, is arguing that the Justice Department has done something wrong and for political reasons has not had an indictment in this case. Uh, and, and I read what I have before us, giving every benefit of the doubt to the Justice Department, maybe I should do that, maybe I shouldn't, that there is still a possibly an open investigation of Mr. Intriago. It, well, how far does your immunity run here? Is it use immunity? Is it transactional immunity? Well, you'd if have he to answers have one of Mr. Bennett's questions in, in, in a particular way, will the Southern District of it New would be York use, be? Use immunity only. Use immunity only. Well, I, I, that, that I, goes back then to, to, to what Mr. Dawson said before. There are, you have to understand, there's two, there were two referrals made, one to the Southern District of Florida, which I think is where all the questions are coming to us about. And then there was a second part that also involved the Castros and certain things that were going on. And that was referred to the Southern District of New York. And that's not something that we understood you were interested in or concerned about. The, the reason I mention it, though, is because that may that may explain why someone's not being offered immunity. Maybe, maybe there, there, there's a concern there. I don't know. The bottom line, I think, Mr. Barrett, and I say this with the utmost of respect, you're asking the wrong prosecutors those <laughs> questions. I, I, we can't answer our, our those federal, questions. Our federal brothers and sisters are in a far better position to answer these questions if, than we if are. If Mr. Barrett would, re would, would yield just for a moment. I would yield. I want to answer your question. It's the position of the chair that uh, there should have been a thorough investigation of the whole matter and justice was given ample time to look into it, and they chose not to, and the statute ran. And that was my concern, and still is my concern. Why didn't justice uh, follow up on this? Why didn't they have a complete Well, if I may reclaim my time, sure. they did look into it. They did interview people in Florida. Um, and I am not convinced, and this is a question I'll have if, we talk, if, if the Justice Department is here, that they haven't, they haven't completed it. I, I find it somewhat ironic when I sort of juxtapose this with the, the Whitewater grand jury that's now been meeting for four years um, and talk about the speed with which one has to complete an investigation, um, that, that there's criticism here that it hasn't been completed and we're now four years down in Little Rock uh, and, and we haven't completed that. So again, again, what I'm asking you, and I'm, I'm just well, the gentleman, judge, I, I would yield. You know, the, the crux of the matter is whether the chairman's correct that the Justice Department is not acting properly. That's, that's his accusation. It's just so peculiar to have an accusation like that, which he has not been able to establish except to allege, and then not have the Justice Department here to tell us what they're doing. We, we know that they've, uh, we know that they've uh, sent FBI agents to talk to Mr. Intriago and his, fo and his former assistant, Wendy Brown. Uh, we know that they've done that. We know that they've asked the chairman not to give immunity to Mr. Intriago. Uh, we, we understand, I think, from them, at least I have it on my notes, that they say that, uh, that they, they've also interviewed members of the Castro family and that they are, are proceeding. They haven't closed this case, as far as we know. So it's just, it's just so peculiar we have this hearing on this issue, especially when we are told that what this investigation is all about is massive funnels, funneling of money from China to influence American foreign policy. Even if we acknowledge in this case that there was Venezuelan money improperly brought into an, a, a fund uh, 
to reimburse a contribution to the Democratic Party. There's no evidence that the Democratic Party knew anything about it. There's no evidence that even, uh, the, certainly that the President would have known about it. To, and, um, and just, the, we've heard a couple of statements. We heard that Mr. Intriago is a friend of Vice President Gore. There's no evidence to, to support that accusation. That was a statement the chairman made. Another Republican member said Mr. Antriago is, is a part of the administration. Well, I guess he was in the late 60s, early 70s, but what does that have to do with when he's in private practice in the, in the 1990s? It just, uh, and then of course, I want to read this chairman's statement in the Larry King Live show last night. Uh, he was asked, whether his investigation was in disarray. Burton, it is not in disarray. We're moving ahead. Tomorrow we're going to have a hearing. We're bringing in a fellow who laundered $50,000 from Venezuela. We think part of it might have been drug money. Mr. Morgenthau, the district attorney in New York, a Democrat, referred some of this information to us. We finally got this fellow in a safe prison so he wouldn't be stabbed or hurt when he testified. Uh, it may be accurate, but part of it's not. First of all, I guess it wasn't 50000 We have no evidence it was drug money. Uh, it, I, it sounds like the implication of that is that he's about to be assassinated for coming before, courageously coming before this committee, when in fact the only evidence we have is that he feared for his safety because nobody likes any, anybody in prison to cooperate with law enforcement whatsoever. So maybe that's technically accurate, but I think the impression is something more is there than uh, the reality of it. I yield back to you. Thank you for uh, letting Again, you I, I guess just to sort of to get your view on this, do you have confidence that the Justice Department is doing its job adequately? Throughout the United States? Absolutely. In this, in this instance? Don't know. I can't answer that question because I don't know. All I know is, and I believe all Mr. Price knows is, we gave them a witness. We gave them the documents. That's it, as far as we're concerned. We gave them a lead, a very, very good lead, and what they chose to do with it is their business, not ours. Okay. Were you surprised that you were asked to come up here? I was. Yeah, I, I, I was too. I thought that when we spoke to the uh, when we spoke to the majority staff and minority staff, that that would that would be it. I mean, I have to tell you that uh, this is the last place I ever expected to be. It's a beautiful day. I wouldn't know that I've been in here all day. Okay. <laughs> but I think, and, and maybe you were here earlier, I was commenting about the state of this committee. I think you can see what a cutting edge uh, discussion this is by the number of people who are at, in attendance here, uh, that this committee just frankly isn't taken particularly seriously. I yield back to Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of our time. I uh, will take uh, five minutes here real briefly, and then I'll yield to uh, counsel for his ten minutes. Uh, did you did you want to speak? Uh, Ms. Well, why don't I yield to you right now, then, uh, Mr. Right. Horn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've enjoyed your testimony today. Uh, you're obviously professional prosecutors, and the, the way I read it is, uh, while it's the federal government prosecutor's problem, uh, you felt you were doing the best you could to give them a case really on a platter. There was the witness, there was the evidence, and all the rest. And uh, in a sense, they blew it because they didn't act within a time period, at least under what was thought to be the time period at that time. Now, whether they're doing anything now, none of us know. We'll eventually find out. But uh, I take it you weren't exactly happy with your hard work and the time you spent. I don't know if you flew to Miami, did you, or did you just talk to them on the phone? To, uh, well, the, the, the first, the, the, an assistant district attorney in our office, not one of us, went to, went to Miami and met with a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of Florida in the fall of 1996. Um, we haven't been to Florida on this case. Well, no, Dawson that's not I, true. I haven't. Excuse me, I have not. I, I, went, I had to fly to Florida to uh, I appeared in connection with the extradition. Uh, Did you talk to the person that the other member of the staff had talked to? No, no. This is before. This was bef long before we referred the matter. Yeah. Uh, who was the assistant United States attorney to whom you talked? On the, uh, uh, the, the one Southern that I District. spoke to was um, Dick Gregory of the Southern District of Florida. That's the gentleman that I spoke to on the phone down there, but there was a second assistant U.S. attorney as well. 
Afterward? Afterward. That was... Uh, the, the assistant district, the assistant U.S. attorney who came up and interviewed Mr. Castro with two other AUSAs from the Southern District of New York uh, was a gentleman by the name of uh, Br Bruce Udolf. How do you spell last name, do you think? I think it's U-D-O-L-F. U-O-L-F. Now, in the case of the Southern District of New York, you probably have very well known contacts there in the U.S. Attorney's Office because you often their joint jurisdiction matters. Uh, what, uh, when you have a case like this, uh, how do you go about finding the right person in the U.S. Attorney's Office who might have an interest in it? We don't assign particular assistant U.S. Attorneys to matters. We refer matters and then an assistant U.S. Attorney contacts us or we're given a name. And, and, and you just send it over to the U.S. Attorney and well, say, we, we, we'd we, like to talk to somebody that knows something about it? We don't, we don't, when you say you, if something like this is going to be referred out of the office, it's not a decision that Mr. Dawson or I would make. It's a decision that would be made by our superiors. In this case, the person, the first assistant DA that I was telling you about who actually went down to Florida, right. he's, he's, uh, he's a member of the executive staff of the district attorney. He's the one who actually referred the case. Would that case ever rise to Mr. Morgenthau's level? Um, that handled uh, by the first assistant. Well, uh, no, the, the, the gentleman that, that Richard was just referring to is not the first assistant. He meant first in terms of the first one to talk to someone in. I see, but he's a supervisor, That's obviously, correct. in the hierarchy. And he's, uh, he's a supervisor. He's the deputy chief of the investigations division. He was the person who made the referral, and I, I suspect he consulted with people above him before he did that. Yeah, and I know you've got a big office. It's probably one of the largest law offices in America, isn't it? It's, it's pretty big. Uh, what is it, a thousand? No, it's about, there's about any time between 550 and 600 assistant DAs, give or take a few. Yeah. Plus support staff. Plus support that. staff. Uh, and, you know, uh, Mr. Morgenthau's reputation is well known and for as a man of integrity, so I appreciate you doing all this. But when you deal with the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, do you have some well-worn contacts, or was this person that discussed it with you a new face to you? you? Know, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't mean any disrespect, but um, the matter that we referred to the Southern District of New York, for all I know, is still ongoing. So I'd prefer not to really discuss okay. it. No, that's fine. And, it's, and it's, not, it's not related to what we've been asked about and what I've listened to today since I've been in attendance that has nothing to do with that as far as I know. Okay. Was there any evidence in this case of conduit uh, uh, that we saw the checks this morning on where New York would have any jurisdiction in the U.S. Attorney's Office well, since they were involved in bank fraud and everything else? The U.S. Attorney in New York? You mean, you mean the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York? Yeah. Would they have I, any cause for jurisdiction of this case? There are various ways to look at jurisdiction. In fact, when we did the Castro case in the first place, we as New York prosecutors, New York State prosecutors, uh, were asked frequently, why, why are New York State prosecutors prosecuting Venezuelan bankers in connection with a fraud in a Puerto Rican bank? The, the, the bottom line is that New York is basically the financial capital of the world and a lot of transactions go through New York. Now you know from some of the evidence that's been supplied to you in the documents that some of these transactions went through Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. Whether someone could parlay that into a jurisdictional basis for proceeding in the Southern District of New York is again something that you'd have to ask the federal prosecutors. And now the public integrity section, you didn't have much luck with them as I understand it. Was that just not returning phone calls or did you ever get a human being that could make a decision well, on it? I, you know, I, I, to this day I don't know how the public integrity section and the campaign finance task force inside the Department of Justice are connected or whether they are or whether they aren't. You would know more about that than I would. But when, after I was unable to get, reach Mr. Raddick, my, my phone call was returned by another trial attorney. I think I mentioned that in my preliminary statement. And uh, he came to New York on July 23rd, and he, and he came to my office, and we, he spent most of the day there with an FBI agent. And then I heard it from him again on September 4th when he called and said that he needed some of the checks and the <coughs> bank statements uh, because he didn't have good copies. So I sent those to him on September 4th, and I believe that was the last day that I spoke to the gentleman. And, and what was his name? What was his name? Yes. Uh, the gentleman, the trial attorney's name th that I dealt with was Peter Ainsworth. Peter Ainsworth. 
Well, I see my time is up, Mr. Chairman, so I yield back whatever is left to you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Barrett? Just a very couple of very, very quick questions. The person you first dealt with in, this, in the Florida office of the U.S. Attorney's Office, that was the person that ultimately went to the independent counsel's office? No, that was, no, the first person was Dick Gregory. Okay. Uh, I spoke to him first, and then Richard and I had a conference call with him to discuss some of the issues that we talked about before about the statute of limitations. And then after that, when, when Jorge Castro was debriefed by the federal prosecutors, Mr. Gregory, I think, was, on he was engaged on trial. He couldn't come, so Mr. Udoff came. And I met him in my office, and I spoke to him, and I alluded to that in my, in my preliminary statement. And then Mr. Udoff left the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida. And then after that, I'm told that the case was pulled from or removed from the uh, Southern District of Florida and brought to Maine Justice as either part of the public integrity section and or the campaign financing task force. And again, I don't know how those two relate to this, each other. And this is more just out of curiosity. When, when Mr. Udoff was in your office, was it his case or was it still Mr. Gregory's case? Uh, I, th I think that they were, I think they were going to work together. I, I had the impression they were going to work together on the case. And then that's, that's, that's not unusual. I mean, Mr. Dawson and I work together on cases all the time. And did Mr. Udoff go directly then to the independent counsel's office? Well, I spoke to Mr. Udoff sometime in the summer, and he told me that he had been assigned to work for the independent counsel. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I've answered your question. Given what you've said about the statute of limitations, would you be surprised now if there was any indictment arising out of this case? Well, in one sense, yes. Because if, if in fact, as, as I believe some members have speculated if in fact the potential defendant were to be Mr. Intriago, um, the, the witness who had direct conversations with Mr. Intriago has now been sentenced and has uh, little incentive to cooperate, yeah, see, I imagine. Other than getting out of jail. Well, no, I well, mean, y you have to understand that it's, it's, it's standard operating procedure among prosecutors that if you've got a cooperating witness, the last thing you want is to have him sentenced before he's finished testifying completely, not just in a, a grand jury, but at trial, any, or any trials that he's going to be testifying. And only then, after then, would you want him to be sentenced. And in New York, it's actually a little more, in New York, we don't have a Rule 35. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where you can get a reduction of sentence after sentencing. In New York, once you're sentenced, you are sentenced. There's a statute that says the sentence shall not be changed, period. Do you know whether that rule applies in the federal sentencing of Mr. Castro? There is no rule? federal sentencing of Mr. Castro. Oh, it's okay. a state it's case. A state so, th gotcha. in other words, Rule 35 would not apply, and once he's sentenced, his sentence can't be changed. So you'd want him to testify before he's sentenced. Yes, I understand. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I don't know if you, if not, I would yield back my, Mr. Waxman, I yield to Mr. Waxman. You're saying that you don't think there could be a prosecution because Mr. Castro might not testify? No. The question was whether I would be surprised, uh -huh. and the answer was, if Mr. Intriago were to be a potential defendant, mm -hmm. I would be surprised because uh, the, whoever's the federal prosecutor uh, will have waived his right, basically, to have Mr. Castro testify against this potential defendant. Of course, all of this is speculative. I don't know if there will be we're, a prosecution. We're telling, you, we're telling you what our experience is. Our experience is that if you've got a cooperating witness, the last thing you want is to have that cooperating witness sentenced before he gives the evidence the at trial. The cooperating witness you're talking about was Mr. Castro the testimony? Any cooperating witness. But, but in this case, it would have to be Mr. Castro? Or I guess, yeah, I, well, that's, that's when he asked, were you, when the gentleman asked, were you would you be surprised? That's what we were responding to. We were assuming he was talking about Mr. Castro. Mr. Castro testified this morning in a way that seemed to incriminate others in sending foreign money through to reimburse him for a contribution that he made. The offense we're talking about, th there may be bigger offenses right. than, than, than whether somebody was reimbursed for a campaign contribution. Well, f for example, bank fraud, <laughs> we know is a, big, a pretty big offense, and we've got a couple of people in jail. We have Mr. Castro and his grandfather in jail. Any, anybody else? In well, actually, all, all, f all three of them are in jail. The, it's Third the grandfather, Orlando Castro yeah. Orlando, or the grandfather got one to three. The Orlando Castro Castro got two and a third to seven, and Jorge Castro Barreto got three and a half to ten and a half. 
you know, I, I thank you for your, your hard work in getting that conviction, but if a prosecutor had to rely on the testimony of those characters who you described as, simply put, these are individuals who thought they could fool other people, their employees, their customers, their regulators, or auditors. You're quoting my summation? Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm quoting your words back to you. If a prosecutor had to rely on their testimony, they're not the most credible witnesses. And it, it could be that a prosecutor would look at it, a, a federal prosecutor would say, you got this Mr. Castro who's in jail for fooling a lot of people and defrauding them, and he's going to say something about somebody else who's going to deny it. So I guess as, a, as prosecutors, you always have to rely a uh, question whether, whether the, not only can you get the testimony, but can you, can, is it credible enough to get a conviction? That's why corroboration is so important. Right. That's why the documents are important. Right, but they, they tend to corroborate the fact that it's foreign money, and they may corroborate, but may, may not be sufficient for a burden of beyond, the reason, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt to convict an individual uh, f whose, whose reputation, as far as we know, has never been besmirched. Who right. Deny yeah. it. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to yield to counsel and just take a minute of his time. Uh, the gentleman from California indicated that FBI agents had uh, talked to Mr. Entriago. Uh, he must know something we don't because the information we have is that Mr. Entriago has not been investigated or contacted by FBI agents in any way. And that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I felt that it was extremely important before the statute ran and before this gentleman was sentenced that there'd be a full investigation of Mr. Entriago to see if this was a pattern of bringing in illegal foreign contributions to try to influence maybe some of our policies with an elected official. Uh, yield to the council. Could you yield to me just on that point about Mr. Entriago being questioned? Well, we only have 10 want. minutes here and the council has it. Uh, real briefly, go ahead. Well, I, I just want you to know the reason we know that he was interviewed by the FBI is because Mr. Intriago's lawyer a answered the question we asked of him, and he said, well, that, that, that they had been uh, questioned by the FBI, that the Justice Department sent them over to pursue this issue. That's how we know about it. We'll double check that. Mr. Price and Mr. Dawson, hi again. Um, one of the things that's come up recently is whether the uh, Department of Justice has or has not moved forward with any investigation of uh, conduit contributions here. And I wanted to ask a couple of uh, very brief questions on that. Um, Mr. Dawson, is it correct? Uh, let me interrupt just real briefly. Uh, I've just been informed by counsel that the, the FBI interviewed him regarding some customs, uh, possible customs offenses, but had, that had nothing to do with the question at hand, and that uh, Mr. Intriago and the uh, question of the illegal campaign contributions has taken the Fifth Amendment, hasn't talked to the FDA, FBI about that. Go ahead, counsel. If we could just put up uh, Exhibit V in dash six, uh, which is a copy of a check from Maria Castro to the Maryland Victory Fund. Uh, is it correct to say, excuse me, I'll give you a moment to look at that. Is it correct to say that um, prior to this year, you had not seen a copy of this check, Mr. Dawson? We had not seen a copy of the check until you've just flashed it on the screen. Did you at any time ask the Department of Justice to subpoena this, uh, the bank records of Ms. Castro to see whether there were reimbursements or whether the checks were cashed that she we, we had subpoenaed the bank records of um, Ms. Castro and got account statements and specific checks that we had requested um, because we didn't have, well, because we didn't have a copy of the check in the Dominican Republic, obviously we didn't know what check number to ask for. Uh, it, there came a time when we suggested to representatives of the, of the Department of Justice that she should get a copy of this check. We also suggested that they should get better copies of uh, all the checks. Do you know whether they did uh, obtain copies of the checks? No. We just know that we gave them the original microfiche copies of the ones that we got directly from the bank, and those were three. Right. Well, that's that was on the September 4th letter that I, I think I testified about earlier. That's um, something we can follow up on and, and find whether they did or did not at any point request those checks. Um, staying on the subject of, of uh, Maria Castro, uh, have either of you ever spoken with Maria Castro? I have not. Mr. Dawson? No, I have not. Do you know whether anybody from the Department of Justice has ever talked to Maria Castro? Defense counsel at sentencing suggested uh, that uh, other members of the Castro family had been contacted who were not defendants in our case. I took that to mean that someone had talked to Maria. We, uh, it's my understanding from uh, information provided to other staff yesterday on both the majority and minority side that 
Um, Ms. Castro was spoken with last week uh, after the notice of our hearing uh, came out, and, and my assumption is you would have no information as to whether that's correct or incorrect. Is Absolutely We have no not. information about that. Um, just going back over a couple of last a couple of last points from your opening statements, um, you both indicated that federal prosecutors in Miami were involved in this case, and that later Department uh, of Justice lawyers in Washington were involved in the case. And Mr. Price, in your opening statement. Uh, you made the following point, and I quote, uh, and this is in reference to an, an assistant United States attorney in Florida. He thought the case deserved a thorough investigation, and his office intended to give the case a close look, and he was confident that the investigation into the alleged political contributions could be completed by the date upon which we theorized that the statute of limitations might run. And then Later on, you, you said that um, you were told that the Office of Public Integrity of the U.S. Department of Justice had removed the political contributions case from the Southern District of Florida to the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Right. What was meant by that? Well, well first of all, the, you just read where I, where I talked about the second AUSA. I'm talking about Mr. Udolph. That's what he told me. Um, when you say what was meant by the case being transferred to the Department of Justice. I, I, I can only tell you what I was told by uh, the defense attorney who represented Jorge Castro and, and by, I think it was Mr. Gregory, who, who I called in the Southern District of Florida to confirm that the case had, in fact, been transferred to Washington. And, and what I was told was is that, by the way, the, the defense attorney that I'm talking about was not the defense attorney that was sitting here with Mr. Castro today. It was somebody else. It was his trial, it was his trial defense attorney at the time. Um, I was told that the case was, was, was removed from the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida uh, because it involved campaign, it, it, it was an investigation involving co political contributions and, and that therefore it was being sent to Washington. No other explanation was given to me and I didn't ask for any additional explanation. You, you also indicated that once the case was taken away from Florida and, and taken over by the department in Washington, uh, that nothing was being done. Um, can you provide? Sure. What I was said, well, actually, what I said was, is that the the, the defense attorney called me on the phone uh, in 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 late June, early July, and said basically, listen, nothing's being done, and my client's going to face the sentencing judge without any cooperation to show uh, that judge. And gee, what's going on here? Uh, what's going on? So I I called and I I found out that the case had been transferred. And then, as I stated earlier, I then called the uh, public integrity section, the chief of the public integrity section's office, Mr. Raddick. And then eventually, someone called me back at my request uh, who was assigned to the matter, and that was Mr. Ainsworth. And Mr. Ainsworth came to New York on July 23, 1997, and it was Mr. Ainsworth who called me on September 4 uh, and asked me uh, if I could send him copies of uh, some banking documents. I think you have the letter. The committee has the letter. Um, and Mr. Ainsworth, so I, I had pr probably several conversations with Mr. Ainsworth in terms of setting up the logistics before the July 23rd meeting where he came up to New York. I invited him up. And then uh, we, we talked on the 23rd. Then the next time I spoke to him, I believe, was on the 4th of September when he called asking for the documents that, that tended to corroborate the testimony. Um, and uh, that was the last time I spoke to him. Just one, one last question, and I'll address this to you, Mr. Dawson. Did you at any time have great enough concerns or, or serious enough concerns that you discussed or, or contemplated trying to take the case back and have your own office uh, do something with the conduit contributions case? Yes, we had conversations about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, let me follow up on that. When you had the conversations about it, what were those conversations involving Mr. Intriago? Well, I'm reluctant to answer the question be only because it involves questions between, I mean, conversations between assistant district attorneys in our office and the question whether to basically take back a matter that had already been referred 
is, is sort of a touchy area, well, me, and I really don't want to go it, into Let me put it another way. Well, Mr. Intrago was one of your concerns when you referred it to the federal, federal authorities, right? The entire matter, sure. Sure. Including him. All right, uh, the gentleman yields back his time. Do you have any more comments? Uh, we, you have five minutes left. I'll reserve my time. Well, yeah, very, I want you to very use briefly, your time if, if you want to. If not, uh, very briefly, if I may, Mr. Well, Chairman, you, you, you have five minutes on your side. You used one of you has used five minutes. You have five minutes left. And I want to reserve my time, just as your counsel was permitted to reserve his time. Are we finished with the hearing? We're going to end the hearing now, so we can go vote, right? Oh, okay. Uh, so, if you have comments, uh, we'd like to do. I, uh, let me uh, take my time. Yield, yeah. Mr. Barrett. Thirty seconds. If I, if I could, I'm looking at the letter dated. It's stamped October 17, 1997, from Lee Raddick, uh, Chief, to the, Mr. Price. And in it, it states, based upon that interview, uh, oh, Mr. Barreto answered all questions put to him and otherwise cooperated with the agents throughout a lengthy interview. Um, my, my only question is, was this, was this letter presented to the, the sentencing judge? Um. Yes, I presented it at sentencing. Well, Mr. Dawson actually spoke I at sentencing. I read it into the record at sentencing. Okay. Thank you. Are you finished? No, no. I, I'm, not, I'm just asking my counsel for clarification before I pursue this. Okay. I, I, I just want to say for the record, Mr. Chairman, that it's our understanding that the Department of Justice has sent the FBI to ask Mr. Entriago and, his, and an aide of his about this very issue. Uh, they may have pursued other issues, but that's my understanding. And, and, and they also have interviewed uh, members of the Castro family uh, about this whole question. I think that's important to know, uh, and it's important to hear from the Justice Department more officially if this, is, if, this, if this whole hearing today was to try to accuse the Justice Department of improprieties, I don't think it's anything other than an unsubstantiated charge to that effect. And the, uh, the best way to get uh, clarification of it would have been to have the Justice Department here. I, I, um, I, I want to just also, since it's my time, read again what you said last night about what we should expect from this hearing, because I didn't know what we were going to get from this hearing today. But you said, tomorrow we're going to have a hearing. We're bringing in a fellow who laundered $50,000 from Venezuela, and I assume it isn't either of you. It would have been Mr. Castro earlier. We think part of, part of it might have been drug money. Evidently, that's a statement for which there's no evidence. Mr. Morgenthau, the district attorney in New York, a Democrat, referred some of the information to us. We finally got this fellow in a safe prison so he wouldn't be stabbed or hurt when he testified. And then I didn't read, but I, I should, for, for all fair purposes, complete the, the, that part which is relevant to this hearing. We're also going to have two of Mr. Morgenthau's prosecutors before the committee and I think you're going to see a lot of evidence come out. Well, that's what we were promised on the Larry King show last night if, about this hearing. And I have to say about this hearing uh, that uh, I don't know really what to make of it. Now, I'm going to have my staff double check to make sure my information is accurate because I don't want to make any statement that's inaccurate. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to give innuendo and accusations and uncorroborated statements because I don't think that would be fair to anybody involved. So, so I will uh, check that out. But it was my, uh, my understanding, we should get it from the Justice Department, uh, that uh, the Castro's and Mr. Antriago has been interviewed uh, uh, on this uh, question. Chairman, I, I, I want to yield since I still have time to Mr. Barrett. Uh, and I want to thank both of you for being here and thank you for the job that you're doing. But again, I have to comment on, on this committee because I think that you have, you have raised some questions uh, that deserve to be answered. But I believe that if this committee was interested in fairness, this committee would invited the Justice Department to be here today. I, mean, I just I don't understand how you can have the person set the plate, you put the food on the table, um, and then you don't you don't have the guest arrive and because the Justice Department is the person or is the department that's under attack here. And so what we do is we throw these innuendo out and, and it would make all the sense in the world to an impartial observer to let's have the Justice Department come in. I frankly thought when you said the Justice Department would be, we'd hear, hear from them, I thought we'd hear from them today. There's no reason to sort of let this hang on other than just let's just throw this out in the air and see what happens. So I'm disappointed. Um, I think that we deserve to know the answer. Um, 
And I think if we were interested in justice and fairness to all parties, we would ha have done it all on the same day. And, and my question to you, Mr. Chairman, is do we have a time certain when we're going to hear, when we're going to be able to hear the testimony from the Justice Department? I'll answer on my time. Uh, I'll, I'll yield uh, to the chairman. I'll to answer. answer. I'll answer on my time. I'll yield back my time. So you the gentleman yields back about this time. time. Uh, as I said earlier in the hearing, we will have the Justice Department up here. Uh, it's now four o'clock, and uh, we didn't want to run this thing on into the late night hours. But we will have the Justice Department up here, and we will ask them the questions uh, that were raised today. Now, let me just also say that you, gentlemen, continue week after week when we have the hearings to try to poo-poo the importance of the hearings. And I understand that's your job. Your job is to uh, obfuscate and obstruct and do everything you can to keep us from getting at the facts. We will not be deterred. Now, let me just say one other thing. Mr. Waxman has made a representation that is simply not accurate. He said that he sees no evidence of an investigation of foreign money involving Republicans. Just this week, counsel for the minority requested of chief counsel for the majority that there be an interview of the wife of a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate, Matt Fong of California. We agreed to that interview. This is in connection with Ms. Fong's work with the National Policy Forum, which has Republican affiliations. Our entire investigation involving Ted Siong and the foreign money he gave to campaigns is exploring both Democrat and Republican contributions. Furthermore, Mr. Waxman last week opposed immunity for one of Mr. Siong's closest associates, Ken La. Kent Law. As Mr. Waxman knows, Kent Law is involved with marketing red, red pagoda cigarettes in the United States and China, which ought to be of interest to you. Uh, let me further say that uh, I just uh, talked to my chief counsel a moment ago, and he said if you have information that the FBI has talked uh, to Mr. Intriago about this case, uh, then it's something that uh, has happened in the last 10 days because 10 days ago he talked to them, and they said they had not interviewed them in any way about this. So that must be new information. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I know it's been a long day. Uh, we believe you have contributed, and uh, we appreciate very much your time and effort. And uh, I, I sure would like to have a couple of more answers I don't think you're going to give us about when you considered taking this case back, but uh, maybe we'll find out about that at some later date. Uh, this uh, meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. In a few moments, Washington Journal, Major Garrett, congressional correspondent for U.S. News and World Report, will talk about today's news. And a U.S. representative for the Palestinian Liberation Organization will discuss Middle East peace efforts. The House returns tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern for a pro forma session with no business scheduled. Business resumes on Tuesday. Next week, members will begin debate on the